Boom. What's going on, buddy? We're here. We're live. Brand new Poker Live podcast. This is the third podcast this week. We had on Matt Berkey on Wednesday, my man Phil Galfar on the Poker Yoda on uh, on Thursday. We had a news video on Tuesday that went up. And then today, uh, joining me on the podcast to wrap up the week is a young gentleman who just got done playing the 300K Super High Roller Bowl. Played one of the uh, strangest hands of the Super High Roller Bowl that we're going to talk about when he had King Jack versus 7-8 against quads against Daniel Negrano, Kid Poker, a.k.a. Bouncy house man, the guy that never stops moving around during the tournament. And uh, we're definitely excited to talk about Dan, about his million dollar charity drive, which inspired uh, one of the top DFS players, Polte Attic, to donate 50% of his winnings for, I think it was last week's uh, DFS slate. And the, the guy won over $2 million. So he donated half of that to the charity drive as well, too. This is uh, multiple years in a row. Dan's been doing this. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Dan's adventures in the high stakes cash game streets all around the world. Cause this kid loves to play cat. This kid's, I don't know. I've never feels like every time I talk to him or see him, he's, he's playing a lot of poker at some capacity. So tournaments, cash games, the man does it all traveling and he, uh, he's wearing a tank top today. So we gotta, we gotta get, the, we gotta get the tank top back out. It's been a little bit, man, but what's going on, Dan? Welcome back to the podcast, my friend. Thanks. It's been a while. I'm excited to be here. What's going on, Poppy? What have you been, what have you been up to brother? Besides wearing cowboy hats around and, and uh, and and start million dollar charity drives. I've been spending more time in San Francisco. Um, I also I bought this condo after the one drop, which was pretty cool. Almost the exact amount that I personally profited was what and a condo that caught my eye cost. And I ended up pulling the trigger on it. Uh, but I've been spending a bit more time in San Francisco. I actually haven't been playing that much poker relatively this. Year. You haven't been playing that much poker this year, you said. Yeah, um, I have the stops where I go for hard for like two weeks at a time, and then I'll take like a month off. And I just, this year, I've tried to have a bit more balance in my life. I tried cooking school this year, and it wasn't really for me, but I did it. I've been taking tennis lessons. Uh, I got a lot of snowboarding planned for the winter, and the charity project has taken a lot of time, too. Well, I mean, you've been uh, you've been grinding pretty hard, brother, for as long as I've known you. I don't, I don't, I don't know how much time you've really taken off in terms of maybe like a month here and there to travel or something like that. For the most part, you've been pretty steady on the grind. And as you mentioned, one drop, third place, million dollar one drop this year, four million dollars profit um, for all the investors involved and yourself. And then you uh, you mentioned you bought a new place at Pan at I don't know if we can say Panorama, but you had your old place there and um, and now you have your new place there. So I'm pretty cool about to actually own, is this the first time you've owned some sort of real estate of your own? Yeah, it's cool. Um, I'd always kept a place in Vegas and it's just, it would be stressful when it, the lease would come up or this and that. It's pretty cool that I, I own it and I can actually furnish the place the way that I like it. Dear God, I hope, remember you posted that photo a couple months back of your bedroom and uh, you talked about not having blackout sheet blackout blinds in your bed now, so now i have uh sheets and stuff on my bed uh, from that tweet rachel lamb benbo's wife uh -huh. responded like hey you're an adult get get it together and like the next day she took me furniture shopping and like we filled up the apartment with like some good stuff and it's looking like a re i really needed some guidance there I, I was gonna say once i saw that by the way reach out to rachel she is uh i feel like she's like a master of a bunch of different things i just, I just think i remember one time I was talking about not eating sugar and she sent me over the GTO cheat sheet on what I can eat that doesn't contain a lot of sugars. So I was like, oh, thank you very much because that was something I, uh, I'm i definitely trying to get better with the diet. But yeah, man, you, uh, I feel like me and you work a bit a little old now, Daniel. I mean, you're still under 30. I, I didn't believe that when I saw the age during Sweat Rollerball, it said 29. I go, this kid's still fucking 29 years old. It feels like it feels like you, you've been around poker for about 25 years now at this point in time. So it, it uh, it's been a long time. Yeah, I didn't see that age come, but yeah, 29, we're getting old. It's about time we take care of our bedrooms. We maybe make our bed. We, we keep some clean sheets on there. We, I'm not a guy who, I happen to make my bed today because I thought it might show up here. JC, who's been staying with me, is a bit like big guy I'm making your bed. I think it's stupid. What? Shout out to JC Alvarado. The, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the guy's got to love that kid. <laughs> I got to say, Dan, that's... uh. I like that guy a lot. I like that guy a lot. Put it like that. Very, fun, very fun man. You want to go out and have a good time? I feel like that man, Dan, should probably be there too. If I'm there, it's probably gonna be a good time as well too. So, but but that 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 man's certainly a fun man right there. He's the guy who will never say no. Like every so often, I try to just like raise the stakes on him, 
just hoping that he'll like one time back down and he's 100% of the time down. It's I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I can understand that for sure. <laughs> why, why do you think making your bed is, uh, why do you think making your bed is not that important? Why do you think it's dumb? I don't know. You're just going to mess it up again that night. Right. Yeah, I mean, I go both ways because a lot of the content I read and you know books I've read, and there's a big TED talk where the guy talks about making your bed in the morning, and it's sort of like this this mental hack to build up confidence and feel like you achieve something early in the morning, so that way, hopefully, you could build on that momentum, and then you make your bed, and then you make something else, and you start the process of being clean and organized in the morning time. So I I usually make my bed pretty often. I'm a pretty big routine nerd, but I don't know. I'll start my day by meditating and do some gratitude stuff. I don't really care to make my bed, but for special occasions, I'll get it done. Yeah, I saw you tweeted out um, something a couple months back about meditation. About uh, I think it maybe it was had to do with Calm, the app. But what, what's kind of right now? Are you are you meditating a lot? Is that a part of your your daily routine? Um, just about every day. Occasionally, I'll miss it, but I try to do fifteen minutes in the morning every day. How do you feel like this manifests itself in terms of when you're playing poker at the table in the moment, making decisions? I think it makes a huge difference. Um, well, I think I almost everyone I think physically has a reaction when they play big pots. I think I do that much less than most people. And I would think daily meditation for seven years has to play a part in that. Sometimes you just are in a situation where it's like, okay, I went from having a really good hand to a bad hand. I have 30 seconds. I'm facing a huge bet. It's really hard to process all the information and not give off tells. I think being mindful just has to make a huge difference there. Do you feel like at this point in time with how much player better players are getting in the uh, tournament world, which I'm assuming you agree with that. I mean, I, I don't know what to do. Right now. Like in the last six months, I think it's been a huge change. So do you feel like now it starts to turn into a, a point where you have to find edges in other places, whether that's with dieting, whether that's with meditation, whether that's with other ways out there that, that people don't talk about right now as much? Not necessarily. I mean, I think it, it does help, but I don't, I don't think diet is super important. I mean, for me, I feel better when I'm eating relatively clean, mm -hmm. but even if people are getting better, there are just so many, like every single spot in No Limit is so challenging. Like, oh, is this a big CBAP board or a small CBAP board? Or like generally you wanna have multiple sizes. Every spot is so challenging. I, th I think I'm one of the best players in the world and very often I'm just guessing as to what I'm doing. There's still a lot of study and then applying that to real time to be doing that we're not like okay everyone plays good let's move on to like the softer skills mm -hmm. uh, i think it does help and for me it's been a difference but all, and it's also just it kind of carries over into like if i'm working out and taking care of myself eating well i feel like i do better at every, whatever i'm trying to do mm -hmm. um but i still think there's people kind of overstate how like even though people are getting good at poker even the best humans make tons of mistakes every day. Unless they're using a real-time software solution program at the same time while they play, and then maybe they're making slightly better decisions than a... Uh, or there's the bot, too, which, you know, I don't know how many bots are playing in the, currently li the current live high roller scene or in some of the live high stakes cash games you're playing in. But hopefully the bots haven't made, it, made their way there yet, Dan. I hope. I don't think there are too many bots. But... Okay, good. Thank God. Because there's, I mean, obviously a lot of speculation online, the high stakes games now is that some of these players may or may not be using some real time software to help them out. And um, I'm not in the know about this scene, but anyone who's playing the biggest cash games that doesn't really want to, I would assume all of the guys playing like 200, 400 with an ante are pretty well versed at all sack sizes because it comes up. Why wouldn't they want to play a 100K poker tournament? Well, this is this has certainly been the uh, this has certainly been the question for for a while. You know, whenever you hear certain people say this person's better, or that person's better, or anything like that, I start you start to wonder. Well, why wouldn't they? But then you, some people say they don't want the challenge. They don't want to challenge something that's best. The edges aren't that high. The ROI is not that high for them. Uh, with all things considered, sometimes with taxes, sometimes with other things like that. Sometimes they're just more comfortable playing in front of the computer rather than getting out there. If you can make it in a live setting, dollars from your living room. 
why why travel across the world? That does make some sense. Listen, I, this is I don't know. I got I remember I think me and Pads had a little back and forth on this about this kind of subject when he was talking about how he felt like some of the players that he staked for thirty dollar tournaments were better than the super high rollerball players out awful, there. And, awful take, by the way. He is. Did you not agree with that take? I mean, I, 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 I these guys are almost as good. No, he has no idea what he's talking about. Okay, so I, I mean, I, I, I personally don't have much experience understanding who's better at tournaments, and I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, honed in on there. I know you're very honed in. You play these on a regular basis. You talk with players on a regular basis. So you don't agree that the thirty dollars people that he stakes and bit be staking would be better than the the high rollers or compete or whatever. I think I, I can't remember the exact wording he used to, to, in that situation. Maybe his point was that they're only like a little bit worse, but even that, like, they're they're not even the same caliber. What what makes you say that? I know how good these people are at the highest level, and like the strategies are really intricate. Um, if you're just if you're that good at poker, why are you playing fifty dollars tournaments? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure they're gonna. Have, I'm sure they're gonna come up with some reasons why, Dan. I, I'm pretty sure I asked that question, and they well, they came up with I'm some reasons. One of those, like, if that's really your opinion, you can make a lot of money betting people against it. Uh, if you really think these people are similarly good, people would love to bet on like the top twenty in the world against them. Yeah, let's kind of let's kind of talk about some of the high roller scene right now in the super high roller bowl. And and you played the event this past weekend. You played a one very memorable hand I posted on my Instagram yesterday. You were playing against Dan the Grano. First of all, let's just talk about Daniel because you had the joy and pleasure to play with Daniel this year, and he was acting I didn't anything like it. Like <laughs> actually, never. Uh, it, it was crazy. So well, what's it like when he's, I, I don't, he, he was like kid, old kid poker, but old kid poker hyped up on, on, on love and, and life and energy. And, and, and I don't know what's going on with that. What was it like playing with that sort of spirit at the table? Cause he was I mean, playing high stakes is my favorite thing. And then playing under like those circumstances I thought was hilarious. Uh, I'm almost never the guy who's like covering my face like in my pose tanking, I'm usually pretty, pretty loose out there. And Daniel was just like on a whole nother level. Um, every hand to observe was, was fun as a spectator when he's calling for the heart against Jake and then oh, he, yeah. it, he makes it years and then just immediately like grabs some chips and just like flicks them in. It's just like, we're playing for 300,000 and he's not, it appeared like he wasn't trying. And then when, in retrospect, he definitely did get some people with, some of his live situations, like the fold against Makita was unbelievable. But I totally had a wonderful time playing, and uh, I thought it was awesome. Yeah, you're mentioning, you're, you're referencing the Jack-10 hand. I think he had Jack-10 of hearts, and Jake had 5-4 of hearts. Flop was a flush draw. I believe Daniel check called. Turn, he's calling for the heart. The heart comes, and he instant bleeds out, and the other guy just yeah. happens to have a flush, so he ends up stacking him. But it was, uh, I don't know, man, it was, was kind of, so it was fun for you as a player at the table. That was something that you enjoyed, that environment, and kind of uh, being around that personality. Yeah, he's always been nice to me. Uh, even before I was, like, one of, like, the, the big high-stakes guys. Um, and, yeah, watching those hands for all of the money. Like, seeing somebody in the tank after somebody's, like, dancing and celebrating them on them, it was, it was just really fun to watch. Uh, he just like kept turning over and hitting like Ali in the middle of hands and like pointing at it. And I'm just like, Oh my God, this guy. Yeah. He was being very, uh, hands-on with, with Ali. Cause Ali was next to him. I think Ali seemed to be enjoying it. You know, he's a I young think kid. Everyone was really loving it except for maybe Jake while he was getting, uh, getting incinerated. Yeah. I think, uh, Jake certainly did not look very happy after he lost one of those. Getting flush over flush like that's pretty rough. I know, especially when the guy I mean, calls for the heart and leads out. And, and I mean, it didn't seem like Daniel was playing super out of line in terms of making these big bets or any any sort of crazy moves like that for the most part. So it was, uh, and I guess that kind of makes the hand he played against you interesting because up until that point, obviously we get to see all the hands and I'm not sure how much information you're getting back from people that, that could just tell you what people's hands and how they're playing and stuff like that. But so the hand he has against you is you raise King Jack offsuit he has seven eights and defends, I believe, the big blind it was. Gonna, uh, there's an important detail. He okay, paused for a little bit, and he, like, briefly, like, did his little thing where he was considering three betting, and he'd previously only been snap acting. So I think by the river, this is going to be a huge detail. Okay, so you said pre-flop he thought about three betting. He thought about three betting. He, like, talked about it, like, 
only for a few seconds, but then he calls. Okay. So I think that should get to come in handy. So flop comes down eight, eight, seven. Obviously it's a good flop for Daniel. He's got a full house. You've got the King Jack. Daniel checks, you check, turns that eight. Maybe brought a flush drop, not positive. Eight, uh, eight, eight. Seven. Clubs. About clubs, right? Okay. So Daniel has the the quads. He bet about half pot, and then it gets to you with King High. But okay. I bet 10 into 26. Yep. I thought, I mean, I think my hand is just good enough that I, I put in a bet here, and I've, I, I generally would have outs. And yeah, I just kind of think it's a call. So you go ahead, you call. River comes down. It's a jack. You make the uh, second nut full house here, or third nut full house, actually. So jack, eight, eight, jack, eight, 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 eight seven. Eight, eight, seven, eight, jack. Jack, what did you have? Well, how, how did you just describe the word? Eight, seven, eight, jack. I just okay. set the cards in the order they came. I kind of reset them in my mind when I think of high card down to low. But at this point in time, the pot's about 46,000, I believe. Daniel bets 50K, and you go into the tank for a while. And now I saw like Chance on, on Twitter talked about they, he made a bet, I believe, with Ben about you were going to fold or call. I thought you were thinking about folding your hand. I'm like, is he thinking about folding? I mean, well, like, okay. And then you raised. I'm like, what's going on? Okay, damn. All right. I really thought he was going to show me nines or tens a lot. So my read, what, and also he'd been pretty honest about what he was talking about. Like it, everything he had been saying up until that point had been very honest. Uh, when I he three bet me and he was like, oh, I have like a pretty good but not great hand. He had ace jack. Uh, when he had a hand against Jake and he was calling for a car that would have given him a straight. Um, he was calling for like a truthful card. So I believed him that he was considering three betting preflop. Mm -hmm. So I thought if he had an eight, it had to be one of the suited eights. So seven, eight, eight, nine, maybe eight, 10. I don't think he would even three bet ace eight in that situation, but I could be mistaken. Mm -hmm. So then let's say it's like four combos of quads Having nines or tens and playing it that way, I thought would be pr – if you have nines or tens, I think it's just very easy to make a pot size bet there. Um, you, think Daniel, you think Daniel would be betting over, – over-betting with nines or tens on the river? Reason. At the time, I thought it would be like a pretty easy play, uh -huh. trying to get money from a seven or ace high. Maybe, um, so then if it's – so I, at the time, I was thinking, okay, if he has four combos of quads and 12 potential combos of smaller full houses, I really should raise. Um, I'm not sh I, I do think it's very possible that I made a mistake there. Uh, I just kind of got in my, like, when I was thinking about it, I, I decided it was more likely that he was going to have tens or nines than quads. And then, of course, he has to pay off the bet. But, I mean, he was playing so goofy. I just kind of thought he would – he has a reputation as a calling station. I thought he would just shake his head a little bit and call. Um, but I thought it was 12 combos of the smaller boats, for like let's say three or four of quads, and then like the chance that he correctly folds, then you – so like you have to reduce some of the boat combos and he does three bets sometimes. Uh, so I, at the time I thought it was a close raise. If I could go back in time, I would have called, but of course. See, seeing the seeing the hand and seeing the cards, yeah. I think it was an ambitious raise, but I think it at least makes some, like the thought process makes some amount of sense. Um, also, when he when he hit his card against uh, Makita, he was like super. He reacted super hard. I kind of just assumed if he would be putting on a little bit more of a show while I was in the tank if he had quads. So just really, everything just kind of added up to me deciding that he was going to show me tens or nines, and I, I went with my read. Uh, so you, you go with your read and then he, so this is kind of weird actually, Dan, I want to talk to you about this. So you make a pretty, you make a raise. I think it was, you bet, you bet 50, you made it one. 40. If you want guys, if you want to watch this hand, by the way, go to my Instagram page right now. It's poppy GTO uploaded the video on December 21st. If you're watching this back later, so you can go to December 21st, 
Uh, it's on my Instagram. It has Dan and, and Daniel next to each other. You can see the hand that we're talking about and uh, just a short clip of it. It'll probably take about 45 seconds. You want to go see that. But you, so you raise River to about 140, 140, something like yeah. that. So you make it 140. He goes all in quick. I mean, it's like all in quick, almost instantly. You have 78K left, but you have one of the rebuy add on chips left. And you tank for a while at this point in time. Talking about how you're getting, I'm getting like over six to one, I think. Right. Yeah. It's a t really tough situation because I'm also coming, like, I mean, I'm thinking back on the hand. Trying to like come to terms with, did I just make a mistake by raising the river and being objective about it? Well, it's just like, okay, I thought he was very likely to have tens or nines there. Um, and then I was just thinking, well, I don't, I mean, I don't know. He just went all in very quickly. But he was talking to you too. You were saying, what do you have? He's like, what do you think I have? I mean, he's being pretty straight. I've never seen this in a 300K. The guy's basically saying like, I've got enough of your money. I've got quads just fold that's what he was that's what, i mean obviously it could have been you know reverse it could have just easily been a reverse uh my favorite line is when i was i was like daniel it really looks like you have quads and he says well if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck <laughs> and at that point i'm like you know what if you're talking about ducks over here <laughs> walking the river on me instantly like good for you yeah he was uh he was being very loosey-goosey at the table skylar i agree no, Dan. I don't think Dan was. I think Daniel was being loosey goosey at the table. I would say I was a little loosey goosey, but nowhere. Nah, nowhere. you're you're always fun. You have like a balance, Dan, of being fun to watch while also always having a cowboy hat on. But then you sometimes tank a lot too. So it's this like mixture. I I I just can't. I mean, I can't bring myself to to just really just like watching you play because I I'm I'm kind of biased. But I always enjoy watching you play. So I, I'm happy to see it at your table and kind of mix it up with Daniel a little bit. You're certainly willing to mix it up a little bit more my opinion than of some other players out there. So I'm hoping it translates to me finally getting to play a big poker after dark game. Uh, I feel like I'm somewhat fun to watch. I talk while I'm playing. I'm, I'll play deep and run big bluffs and talk shit while doing it. I think it's some of these guys who are playing on there. They're just like pretty nitty. And I'm just like, I'm confused as to why they keep getting the invite over me. Well, I, I have an idea why, because I think what happens is, is that, and this is from knowing the people that put on the show for a lot of poker dark that uh, they, you know, a lot of times it's a lot of divas to get these games going, Dan. So you have uh, dealing with certain players, you know, the personalities they can, so they back out. Whereas other players are consistently going to show up when they say they're going to show up. So I think there's a certain uh, Rolodex, let's say of players who they would go to as a default like that. But if you do want to play, and anyone out there wants to play, you can get in touch with me or you can get get in touch with Brett Hanks at Poker Central. I, I put a lot of my friends in touch with those guys as well to kind of get them on the show. And uh, all you got to do is put it out there, Dan, say you want to play. And I think that uh, I think we'll be able to get you on the show. Let me write that down, actually. I'll talk to Brent and okay, let him know. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, we've had, like we had some. Uh, games. It's like a whole different animal than playing a big tournament. Yeah, man, let's talk about cash games for a little bit. We'll get back to high rollerball. So I don't know if people know this about you, but you you play a lot of high stakes cash games, and I, I feel like I've, I've seen you. I go through periods. Um, a couple summers ago, I played like the hundred, two hundred, like every day, crazy hours. Mm -hmm. um, this summer and last summer, I really cut back just because playing cash games or meet really quickly turns into me playing until eleven in the morning. And then I wake up at three. And then, of course, you don't wake up and you meditate and go to the gym. You just go right over to the Bellagio and put your name on the list. And then that just becomes your, your life for a couple of weeks. Yeah, that it can certainly get. I saw you put something in the tweet. You mentioned that you wanted to play more mixed games last summer instead of cash games. And I feel like in years past, when I when I go through or I go to Ari or anything like that, I, I usually see you in some of those high stakes games and some uh, pretty tough lineups, but usually with a very usually some action players in the mix though too but some of the top players in the entire world the true tellers the hollywood haxtons those type of players and then there'd be just a uh there'd be random people in there all yeah. the time so it, it looks like it's uh i guess so what you're not playing a lot of cash games now or are you just deciding to a lot of effort to get into them yeah. i do love playing big cash games the politics is kind of a headache and i do love in tournaments how you just show up and you play um also, a lot of the cash games are played without an ante, and no ante, no limit, it's just an awful game. You're, like, you're supposed to be folding like strong hands to three bets all the time. Mm -hmm. 
uh, an ante just makes the game so much better for a bunch of reasons. Um, I went through one stretch of playing a lot of cash games this year when I was in Macau. Uh, around the super high roller bowl, the guy who organized the tournament, he took a liking to me and he was apologizing that it was kind of a shit show over there. So as a, I, as like a, hey, I'm sorry about this. He got me into, I think we were playing 4K, 8K or maybe uh, HKD, maybe a little, yeah, it was pro I think it was four, started at 2-4 and then got kicked up and the game was just like pretty insane. So I played my first uh, more than 24 hour session I played for like 30 hours over there and I had a, a few days in a row where I went really hard. But other than that, I haven't really been playing cash games this year. So this was for the, uh, during the Triton poker series out there when they had the super high roller bowl, China, China. Triton was different. Oh, it's a different thing. It okay. was around the poker stars. I don't know if it's called ACOP or whatever their thing was. APPT -A Macau, I believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's okay. so many stops now all the time. I got them mixed up. Yeah, I mean, as, as a player like yourself who is willing to play in all these high-stakes tournaments, how do you deal with there being so many more high-stakes tournaments? You mentioned like a, a 50K used to be a big, it used to be a huge tournament. You go play a 50K, it's like I'm playing a 50K. And now every stop has like 100K. And I mean, it's, you go to any, you go almost all the stops, it seems like they have a 50K minimum at least. It used to be any time there was like a 50 or 100K, I would just make a point to go play wherever it was in the world. Now you get to be a lot more choosy. Um, like they just announced the Jeju schedule in March. And I'm very, I think I'm not going to go just because I'm traveling a lot in February. I'm going to Japan. So flying back across the world seems tiring. I try to pick the stops that interest me the most. And I do like try to figure out how much money I'm making. Like there are stakes that I just couldn't say no to. But with, with all of the poker back in Vegas now, it makes traveling across the world a little bit less appealing. And I do really love playing like these Aria 25Ks. They're my favorite stakes to play because they're not quite as serious as the 100Ks. I love the format. I like that they're one day. I like that you can order good food. Um, but yeah, I just kind of pick when I'm feeling like playing, if, I'm, if I wanna go somewhere. I hear Montenegro is beautiful and it's a good casino. So I think I'm gonna do one of the Triton stops there. So I guess for the Aria High Rollers, so you, you it seems like your results have been pretty good in that, but obviously it's hard for outside parties to really know who's winning in those or who's losing in those with the rebuys and because there's so many. I think no one knows, both in like expectation and really results. Mm. Sample size is just pretty small. But sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, have you, so have you been overall winning in those games? I think I've done, I think I've done very well at them. Um, I've just, I would assume that my results have been good. Uh, <laughs> the way that I, I, I have someone that I just message my results and pieces to who like turns everything into spreadsheets. So mm -hmm. I don't look at my own results that closely anymore. Cause I think, I think like the sample size is just irrelevant. But I've just had like so many like three and four hundred k caches that I would assume I have to be up a bunch of money. But I can't be like one hundred percent sure. But I would think so. If you're a new player out there. I do recommend tracking your results in your cash games or tournaments uh, expeditions. Otherwise, you end up like Dan. So Dan, you might be up money if you don't know how much how much you're up or down in these things. Um, you know what? I bet you I could text the bookkeeper and. She has like all these spreadsheets that are really intricate and I don't really know how to read, but. <laughs> what's it like, Poppy? What's it like? Hey, I mean, I'm not sure what's that, you know, 4 million here, uh, 400K there. You just, yeah, it happens. It's okay. I'll take that as, uh, I'll take that as maybe, up, maybe up money. We might find out by the end of, uh, by the end of the show. I guess let's go back to Super High Rollerball. So what did you think overall about the uh, experience this year and, uh, with the second Super High Rollable of the year and the player field being a little bit uh, non-fun player-ish this time around. You know, the guy, the guys we had playing, Rick Solomon, who had success in the one drop in the past. And, and you know, I haven't watched too much Rick Solomon's play. I don't know how exactly how he plays, but even like the Talal Shikarchi, who's more of a, 
you know, more of the amateur kind of player. It seems like he's getting a lot better. He certainly uh, mixed oh, it up yeah, a little bit. Results. He was a grinder online. He did well. Um, I'm under the impression he's been doing very well in the Bobby's room game as well. Yeah. Um, he just just been getting it done for years. Uh, he's certainly not a, a soft spot by any means. Yeah, it didn't seem that way from what I mean. He did make one like call with three bet, but for the most part, he was putting a lot of pressure on. It seemed like he was using. Uh, he made some great folds. Yeah. Um, the super high roller bowl is my favorite event of the year. I really don't like the lammers. Uh, I think the beauty of no limit, especially in a freeze out, like a lot of tournaments are rebuys these days and that's cool. Um, in a freeze out, I think some of the beauty of no limit is that at any point you could be put to a decision for your entire tournament mm -hmm. and the lammers just take that whole aspect away. I think it should be tense from the get-go. And I think you, if you want to play in a tournament like that, you really should have to play 300 blinds deep from the get-go. I get like, okay, you're going to be playing out of position against Ike, who's hitting you with two X-pot over bets, and your time's ticking. It's just a thing that you're going to have to do. Um, I think the Lammers take away like a lot of the beauty of the game. And also, I think one of the hard parts of tournaments is balancing like the play that you know your sol your solver tells you to do, or at least that you suspect. You never really know. It's all you're just trying to correctly apply, but you're trying to do what you think is right. But then you also do you really want to risk half of your stack in a marginal spot against Ike when you could maybe pass it up and wait for a softer spot soon? When there's rebuys, you kind of just don't have to worry about that. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I think the Lammers, I mean, it's cool they tried new things. I think it made day one a lot worse. Um, yes, yeah, so Rose out there uh, unsure what Dan's talking about. Basically, during the Super High Roller Bowl, they introduced a new format where you would have the ability, uh, was it two or three rebuys, Dan? Well, well, how did yeah. that, was it two? One I think it was start and then two rebuys in your tank. Right, so you had these two lammers, so you could either add on 100K chips, 100K chips at any point in time, and I think Rick Solomon was one player. He started with a 300K, or you could start with 100K, and then if you bust, you could add on 100 more, and everyone got it, and then at the end of the time period, which I believe was day one, then you got to add however many lammers to your stack, and it was like an automatic add-on. So what Dan's basically saying is that if you get knocked out once, you get to come back in. So when you're playing against these other players, it just – changes the dynamic so much. And was this something that was was told to you guys beforehand or was it something that you found out about? Um, they, they gave us the structure maybe a, 10 days in advance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to complain. They put together a rake free tournament for 300K. They did a wonderful job, but I think it would be a better event overall to take away the revise. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens here in the future if, um, you know, if that might become a standard sort of approach to tournament poker or if this if more people are going to try maybe adding on with that structure or having the add ons. And I can see a, a merit, I suppose, for, for having that. And I mean, I don't play tournaments. So to me, I don't necessarily have a strong opinion one way or the other on it. But do you think overall that's good for tournaments or would you like to see less of those and more freeze outs or more regular rebuys or I'd like to see uh, a bit less of the super long re-entry period. I kind of liked when re-entries were a thing that would happen. Like if you bust for over a hundred big blinds and you come in, that's cool. But I think when it's okay, there's going to be lots of rebuying with 20 blinds. I think that's a, a little bit excessive. And for the RE 25 case, that's just the way that it is. I think it's totally a great format. I would like to see more freeze outs though in other of the bigger tournaments. Or maybe like, okay, if you're gonna rebuy, starting stack still 100 blinds. So if you have somebody who's coming in five times for over 100 blinds, good for them. A lot of money in the prize pool. Guys, we're live right now. I see a lot of comments out there. Welcome, guys. Thank you. I see people tuning in for the, your, your fourth or third podcast this week. I appreciate that. Daniel Lewandowski, I appreciate the very nice comment, my friend. We uh yeah we put up uh you put up a tweet on Twitter you asked for some questions out there and we got a couple people that uh, that did reply out here with some questions I recognize some of these names let me kind of scroll through it here and see if I can um 
if I can see a good one here. And this is actually something I have written down, something I've been thinking about a lot, which is anonymous, absurd finding says, what's the most important thing you've learned this year? And I'm very curious to that too. What do you feel like is been the big change in your own approach to poker or your life this year? I have come to terms with the idea that almost anything could be a positive, even if it seems awful in the moment. And I think that is a unbelievably important life. Like uh, it could really change the way that you view the world and staying positive. I mean, just makes everything a lot better. Yeah. I think this is something that's commonly said amongst people who, who do teaching or coaching is that positivity or negativity is often a matter of your own perspective and you have the cho choice to view things as positive or negative. I do think it can be challenging to do that when the environment around you is necessarily supportive to being positive in terms of who you keep with as your friends or your family or, or your girlfriend or your work situation. So I guess when you think about that and dealing with that, how important do you think a support system is in terms of staying positive in situations? I think it's unbelievably important. Uh, I totally find myself picking up the habits of people around me. Uh, and I've certainly had to cut people from like my inner circle that I thought were just kind of negative influences too much encouraging me for like either just complaining a lot and refusing to make obvious improvements or like I've had people like really encouraging me to party when I wasn't really trying to be in that part of my life at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, when you're around people who are also bettering themselves or just taking care of themselves, I think it's really easy. It's much easier to establish good habits. Yeah, Depp actually asked a pretty good question. This is going to be my follow up, not worded quite this way. But how do you cut someone off without? He says, "Why do you cut someone off like seeming like a massive douche?" It's actually an uh, interesting thought. Is that how do you cut these people out of your life, and how do you go upon dealing with the emotions that come from from doing something like that? Wow, that is a question. Mm -hmm. Um. I would say in some cases, it's just a matter of physically seeing the person less. Um, I also just think I've generally found with most people, if I am very honest with them, they respond well. And if I tell them that I think some of their habits are carrying over to mine and just not affecting me in, in a way that I like that I'm, it's kind of gone okay. Um, it's a very challenging thing when you have someone who used to be close to you that you decide is no longer like uh, should be in your life. And there, I, I had like one of my oldest friends uh, wronged me really badly a couple years ago. I ended up coming to terms with the fact that he's been a pathological liar since we were kids. Wow. And then he stole from me and then like lied about it. Um, and my initial reaction was I totally just want to help this person. And I guess another important lesson I learned this year was that you can't force someone to change who's not ready to. So I was trying to get this person to make all these good things that eventually it was like, you know what? This is so much mental energy. This person isn't ready and doesn't want to change. I'm going to, cut this person from like one of my people who was like super close to me to someone who I'll text like a couple of times a year. And maybe when they make some changes, they could make a, they could come back into my life. Yeah. It's really tough when you feel like you're doing, you're, you're taking the right steps to help somebody improve, but kind of once again, going back to the idea of a support system, their support system and the people in their lives aren't very conducive for them to make some sort of mass scale change in their habits and their life and you see it one way and then you try hard and you try hard and they just kind of keep doing that same thing and i think for myself i've chose to just take a pretty big step back from those people in my life and um it's tough i don't know i mean it it, it hurts like i you'd want to help people and and it, but at the same time it's like what what what, do you, what can you really do if somebody doesn't want to change and they don't know how to necessarily change for the better in their life how they want to change even if they say they want to change but their actions don't represent that those words yeah it's tough to deal with that so i want to clarify like i feel like in interviews that often i come across like i really have my shit together 
And of course I go through bad <laughs> phases or like sometimes like I'm not always just trying to better myself. So of course, sometimes I go through times where I'm like partying and just whatever. Um, and sometimes I just go through periods of time where I'm like anxious or just like not in a good mental place. Right now, I do feel like things are going really well, but of course it's not always the case. Like I, I'll sometimes get questions on Twitter like, oh, do you ever have bad days? And it's like, yeah, of course, I have bad days all the time. So how, how, do you, how do you deal with the bad days when you wake up and you don't feel like you want to get after it when it comes to poker or business or just anything? I would say exercise is the biggest single thing that could transform me from a, uh, like, okay, from a bad headspace to like the endorphins or serotonin, whatever it is, is like a real tangible effect. And that makes a huge difference. I started going to therapy in the beginning of this year when I was a bit anxious. Um, to the point it was affecting my sleep and having someone to talk to about that regularly uh, definitely helps. And then occasionally I just get an insight that sounds really obvious about my own life. And it's like, oh, I'm glad I had like an impartial observer to just tell me, like that's kind of how I came to terms with the fact that I didn't have to help everyone who's in like a bad situation. Like, oh, this person doesn't want to be helped. I could just leave them be. Mm -hmm. you know, like it sounds obvious when I say it, but I needed someone to tell me. Yeah, I think sometimes you need people in your life that that you respect that you you when they say something to you, you say, oh, OK, I, 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 I put I put a lot of faith in this. And certain people don't have people like that in their lives. And I, I think it can impact them negatively. Whereas I think the people I try to personally keep in my life now, I respect what they say. So if they point something out about me or about anything, I'm going to hold it with a little bit higher regard that I might from some other people I know who sort of say they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. It's like, well, why, why would I listen to you a lot about these things? Even though I feel like it might be accurate, I don't necessarily always give it as much weight when it comes to myself. So it's a uh, interesting thing to deal with for sure. It's been yeah. interesting. Life is tough. Can be, can be hard, can be easy. It depends what your goals are. depends what your ambitions are and, and where you set the idea of success. And I guess I'm kind of curious about that for you. What do you consider to be successful for yourself right now in 2018, December 21st, almost 2019? I would have my number one priority as mental and physical health. And then I kind of for obvious reasons. And I went through a phase earlier this year where like I had a bunch of loved ones going through like pretty severe trauma all at the same time. And I felt like I was able to help them without it impacting me. Like sometimes it could be a huge weight. And I think it's important to remember that if you take care of yourself, you're more equipped to take care of your loved ones. Um, I have some big ideas for, I am hopeful that next year the charity project like goes up by an order of magnitude. So that's something I'll be working on next year. And I also just kind of want to, I guess poker is still important to me, but it's no longer like my clear number one thing. It's just like one of a bunch of parts of my life now. I want to keep playing at a high or the highest level for as long as I can. Uh, I love it. I think it's, I'm using the money to do good. And man, playing these big tournaments really is fun. Like I, I couldn't imagine what else I would be doing. And then I guess getting time for my like closest loved ones, friends and family, new experiences with them, uh, that kind of thing. So I would say those are like my biggest couple priorities. So do you, do you worry at all that spreading that energy out and that focus out and, and those sort of what you consider to be success? Do you worry that that might cut into your overall ability to win at poker and cut into the profit and the success at, at poker specifically as poker has been one of the primary success metrics for yourself like in these past few years? I think at this exact moment, or like, I don't think I'm one of the best couple players. I think there's maybe four guys in the very top tier that are maybe on like a little bit of a level above the others. And at this exact moment, I wouldn't have, have myself in that and I think those guys really are just working super hard for I like, got many hours every day with the solver and 
all that sort of stuff. I think I, but I think I could still have like a very good income at poker, still win at every tournament while maintaining a lot more balance. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't really scare me. And I also kind of think if it gets to the point when I can't be winning at like the big poker tournaments, then man, maybe if, like if those games are that tough, then who's making any money at them, you know? Mm -hmm. like, I'm still working pretty hard at it. I've been doing this for so long. Like, I, I'm not maybe as technically proficient as as Ike in some of these situations, but I still have a pretty good poker mind. So, no, I'm not especially worried about that. Who who do you think those four people are that are in another level right now and that are playing playing a little bit better than other people? It, it was kind of just an arbitrary number it's really hard to say because i don't talk poker with everyone um you know um i'm also a little bit worried about offending some people but um i guess off the top of my head i would say chidwick paxton david peters and uh coon hmm. i don't like i've almost never uh, spoke poker with D. Peters, but he's he's great at the live element. Um, and it's just one of those things where his his bet sizing is always changing. And occasionally, like I remember, I just saw this hand where it was a double paired board, and he let out like a hundred and twenty five percent pot out of the big blind, and he was playing against someone who has like a reputation as a calling station. And my initial thought was that he was just like exploiting this guy's tendencies. And then I reran the hand using his bet size compared to mine, and his was just a lot better. And he just kind of does that stuff kind of a lot. Um, maybe it, that's not how the poker ecosystem works, where like it's just a bunch of guys in like a similar category. But those four, I would feel somewhat confident, confident saying are among the best. But of, I mean, of course, there's a lot of great players out there. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of great players out there, and. You know, as an outside perspective, outside observer, or people that are just watching these tournaments, it's uh, it's pretty hard at home. We're kind of told everyone is the best and everyone's this, everyone's that. Obviously, the Germans had a lot of success, or maybe more specific, Fader Holes had a lot of success, which boosts up the Germans by association a lot of times because, and, and rightfully so, I think those guys are all all great players, with great results too. You 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 got into a little tiff, I guess, at the table with. Uh, with my buddy Dominic Nietzsche, 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 I still don't know how to say his last name. Is it Nietzsche? Dominic Nietzsche. You got into a little tiff with Dominic Nietzsche, Mr. GTO, my 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 living solver over there, Dominic Nietzsche. What's uh what's going on with that? What, what happened with that? He just kept making these remarks to Daniel, and then when he said something along along the lines of, "I just don't think you're finding bluffs there," I just don't think that's a thing you should ever say at the poker table, like especially. Uh, the best case scenario is that you hope Daniel is going to start playing better and bluffing more and playing more balanced. Um, it's, he said it a few times. Um, I just think it's not a way that you should act at the poker table. And I told him some, maybe I came across like, uh, Oh, how did I come across when I did that? I don't know. Well, I, I understood what you're, what you're talking about, but I, I'm sure I, I didn't really uh, hear much chatter about it either way, but it was just fun. <laughs> I found it funny. Like okay. I, I, get, I get where you're coming from because I know how Dom is from talking with Dom a lot. He's very heavy solver based. He likes to make little needles like that. I think he's needling Daniel. Whether that comes off as he's trying to educate Daniel or not, that's his purpose. I don't think so. But indirectly, I believe it, it does draw attention to that for Daniel's perspective too. So I can understand the desire to not want to hear comments like that at the table and uh, be a little turned I off. Like, if it's, if it's like repetitively a going on. Dollar thing. I just think it's so not a way that you treat other people, you know, like this guy's having fun playing a poker tournament, putting him, he, it kind of felt like he was putting him down and there was like no benefit to it. And I don't know, Daniel might just start playing better. Like, I don't know. Might start folding all of his straights on Dodd paired boards when people overbet. Uh, that was one of the best folds I've ever seen. And at the time I thought it was crazy, but rethinking it, is Makita really going to try to bluff him there when he starts celebrating for a card and then it hits 
is he really going to go for the bluff there? And I kind of think Daniel was able to like use all of that live information and go for it. And I wouldn't say he has no bluffs, but I think he actually made like a brilliant above the rim fold there. So for people that missed this hand, uh, this happened, uh, Daniel versus Makita. That's a cool ski fish 2013, uh, uh a longtime high stakes online cash game player who now plays a lot of live poker as well, too. And Daniel raised with the jack 10 of hearts under the gun, plus one, I believe it was. And uh, Makita flatted pocket nines, flop came down six, seven, eight. So Daniel had a uh, gut shot. Makita had the nines. Daniel C bets. Makita raises. Daniel calls quickly and, like, I think calls for a nine. The nine comes on the turn. So it's six, seven, eight, nine. Makita's got the top set. Daniel checks. Daniel Makita celebrates. Celebrates, yes. He like jumps up. He, well, I don't. I can't even. I can't replicate what he does. He celebrates and checks. Makita checks back. I think River. He announced that he's gonna check raise this guy's ass or something ridiculous. That he's gonna check raise. Is that what he said? Yes. He's like, I'm gonna check and then I'm gonna shoot you up. Jesus. Okay. Well, <laughs> threatens him with a shot up and then <laughs> Makita checks back. Discipline check back. Rivers the eight. Bad card for Daniel. Pairs the board. Uh, nut full house for Makita. So six, seven, eight, nine, eight. Daniel checks. Makita bets about 60K into 45K. And Daniel was, was pretty animated up until that point. He stops being animated. He's like, hold on, let me get serious here. He does the Daniel Grano thing. He thinks about it forever, 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 and lays the hand down. And uh, yeah, people definitely celebrated that. So your, your kind of take is that it was uh, on the surface, you thought it was a bad fold, but at the time, I thought it was retrospect. And then in retrospect, I think it was like a truly, truly world class, brilliant fold. But, and I, I sure as hell wouldn't have made it, but I guess also it's, if you're going to be giving like the live stuff he was doing, he was giving off a ton of information, but he definitely was picking up a lot too. And there he used it very well. And he's been playing high stakes for 15 years. He's, he's been in those situations and no one's used to having a guy dancing while a turn card comes. I, man, I can't believe that happened. Yeah, I have to imagine that um, I'm sure there's like a, a, a number of different tells reverse and now like people are just picking up all sorts of things. Obviously, as Daniel said, everything you do at the poker table conveys information. So he's putting up these doing this, doing that. And I'm sure he's trying to balance his actions when he acts excited and when he doesn't act excited during hands and, and during turns and river spots. But I can see why people don't act like that, because you might not think that you're doing something, but then someone else might pick up that you act this way or that way with certain hands. So it's got to be tough to really balance that out from Daniel's perspective when it comes to the way he's acting about things. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm less stoic than most, but he was on a whole nother level. So big takeaway, super high roller bowl was that, what, what do you think about the, 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 do you think it was, I guess, fun? Did you watch any of it? Was it fun to watch or what was kind of your perspective on that? I thought it was fun to watch, but I had a, big financial incentive going on and also oh. I play against these guys. Uh, um, yeah, I, I swapped with uh, Ike and Stevie. Okay. Well, that's, 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 um, that's not bad. I'll take it. I'll take the Hollywood Haxton swap. Listen, anytime you can swap the Hollywood Haxton, I think you, you got to take advantage of that. Yeah. Uh, and he and I have been good friends for many years. It was cool to see, like, see him do well. Like he hadn't, I can't remember his last big tournament win. I think he played true, like really phenomenally as well. Uh, he made a few good, really good folds. Uh, yeah, super happy for him, and I'm happy that he uh, bailed me out on the tournament. So I had uh, had Doug Polk on the podcast a couple months back, and one of the things he talked about was that he thinks the biggest problem in these high roller tournaments <coughs> lately. I'm using my voice. I told you I was uh, Dan was going to come over and do this, but I'm getting a little sick, so I'm like probably uh, I don't know. I just can't speak clearly, but uh, Doug said that the biggest problem in the high rollers is the uh, swapping action and, and, and collusion that he thinks is taking place in these things. And as somebody that plays a lot of the ARI events and with these players, what are your thoughts on that statement? First, I kind of don't like when people make very vague claims and don't back them up. If he wants to like call somebody out, I think he could be a bit more specific. Um, I would say, I mean, pros are piecing themselves out. But I would say the way that almost everyone does it is they make sure that they have like four times as much or that they have a number. 
for mine, I generally, as like a minimum, I'll have four times as much of myself as I do any swaps. Um, there is still some incentive, but at the end of the day, people are just trusting that people will be acting honestly. Um, it's, I think the stakes have maybe gotten slightly out of hand, where like, especially in Vegas, if you have 25K tournaments, people are gonna have like almost all of the action themselves with like a few like 5% swaps, let's say. If you make the tournaments 100K plus, you, I mean, you would just need, I don't know, like $7 million to play them on your own without piecing yourself out. I would say almost nobody has that. And, and then as you throw in taxes as an American, like you just can't be playing that big early in the year. Um, I would say it's not really an issue. In like my, I've watched a fair bit of streams and only two hands have ever looked really suspicious to me at final tables. Uh, the Fox in versus Chrissy B hand. Mm. Look, I thought that was just uh, that was just not a normal hand of poker. And there was also the Mustafa when he folded Queens, he did have a piece of Ole uh, in the Monaco 100K a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Really, those are the only two hands I've seen people play that made me be like, hey, that, that didn't look uh, look too good. Um, and I will say in like Mustafa's defense, his whole thing is that he's a big live read guy and he's always been playing goofy and he happened to be right. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that anything was wrong there, but that's one of the few hands that makes me take a step back and look at it. Uh, look at it. Um, going back to the original question though, I, I think people generally are taking nice size pieces themselves relative to their swaps, which encourages them to have their own expectation as the primary thing. And if you like if tournament organizers and like recreationals are making the stakes so egregious, the professionals are going to be swapping and selling. It's just what they have to do. Otherwise, like I would say I've been one of the more successful poker players over the last decade. And I'm not close to being able to play these super high rollers without piecing out. So as some, maybe some Macau people, but aside from that, no, no one really can. Yeah, I think Doug was talking about people subconsciously soft playing each other, whether it's purpose or not, just people that they're friends with or that they have pieces with or that they swap with, they're going to just play softer against them than they would play against other people like that. I think that, and there's really no way to detect or police that for the most part, obviously on stream we can see, but in the daily events that are happening at the Aria, you know, there's, there's really no way to tell. So that's something I've heard people whispering about uh, certain players might not want to play in those events because they feel like that is a something that's taken place there. Um, I mean, I've heard a couple uh, rumblings and people like talking some shit about the German players, but as someone who plays in those events, I am not worried about like game integrity when I'm playing against uh, playing against those guys. Okay, that's good to hear. It's definitely, um, I think um, people saw the thing that Doug said in there. You know, I, I don't know if, how tuned in Doug is right now with what's happening in the high roller games. Obviously, he's talked to a lot of people and he, and he knows a lot of information. But does he? Does he talk with a lot of people and know information? He certainly has in the uh, past. But I'm under the impression he's not really in the high roller. Like, I didn't know that he still had, was like had people who play big poker anymore. Like, no, I I'm not sure how much. Like, I'm not sure how much poker he's really tuned in. Those guys just don't really play anymore. Yeah, I don't think they're playing much anymore. I'm not really sure if who if who he would be communicating with that is currently still playing a lot or or active in the streets right now. So, but I know he's got all sorts of people he talks with and friends yeah. and buys a lot of pieces, sports bets with a lot of the guys. They're all degenerate. I didn't mean that he's like any sort of shop, by the way. I'm just under the impression he's now a he's completely out of the poker world, but maybe I'm mistaken. He's trying to he's finding himself. I saw him at the mall yesterday, actually. I saw the Supreme Leader doing a little uh, Christmas shopping for for his uh for his country and uh yeah he was uh i don't know man he's just trying to find himself he's like all people are you know they have success they crush it they get to the top and then they they want to find a new challenge so that's i think where he's at i think a lot of people who are doing that they kind of want to keep pursuing financial success and it's like oh you just it's spent the last decade 
pursuing money. Maybe, I mean, I don't know if that's true about Doug. I don't know him very much at all. Uh, but it seems like a lot of people who are on that path trying to find a new thing, pursuing money when you've been chasing money for the last decade seems a little strange to me. But I'm also not very financially motivated. Yeah, I think um, for Doug personally, it's maybe sort of finding a, a passion that also can tie in with business because I think he's passionate about business itself. And the way you keep scoring business is by how much money you make. So it's sort of this thing where that's just the metric of success in a lot of ways for, I think, kind of how he sets up things and whether it's views or whether it's subscribers or whether it's an audience or whether it's money or whether it's those sorts of metrics that I think drive Doug a lot. And, you know, he's also getting older too. We'll kind of see what develops as he moves into the thirties and yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. You never know how things kind of uh, turn out with people. So, but yeah, I think he is out of poker world for better or worse. I don't know. Do you find that a positive thing or a negative thing for poker? Just is. No. I saw something on Twitter you posted. This is an interesting list because people love list. You have a list. MTT players ranked by how fun it is for me to play with them. Number one, Jungle Man Dan. Number two, Steve O'Dwyer. Number three, Nick Petrangelo. Number four, Mustafa. And number five, Bryn Kenny. What's so what's up with this list? And do we do we have any re revisions to this list, or is this the list that is currently still in place for you? Um, I can't think of anyone who I would view as like particularly fun um, uh, that isn't on the list. Mostly they're guys who will, like, will chat while playing. Um, jungle is really satisfying when you could beat him in a pot, and he's just so animated. He's like truthful about what he has right away. Um, I've seen him like kind of have meltdowns, like immediately bring it back together. I find him unbelievably entertaining. Nick Petrangelo, if you've seen him on some of the streams, I think he's hilarious. Um, I mean, also a really great player that maybe would be in like my list of top guys that I forgot to include. But um, I, I was just kind of thinking about people who I enjoy playing with. They're, they're also all people who will never do that thing when you're like, hey, how much are you playing? And they just like move their arms a little bit. And it's like, come on, man, you're across the table. You've been playing live tournaments for so long. I just can't see whether you have like 130 or 180 K. Uh, there are people who will like give you an answer. They'll talk during pots. Uh, I'm a huge O'Dwyer fan too. Uh, some like of the people who are like these real like pile lovers will sometimes talk shit about him, but they should really see what he could do at like a soft, like a soft EPT table. He it's like the, the fear, like the fear of God in him. And he just, I've seen him like run over bubbles unlike anyone else. He's got he's got some real real life skills for sure. Hmm. This is Nick Petrangelo, you said? Uh, O'Dwyer. O'Dwyer. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I mean O'Dwyer. It seems like uh, you know I was kind of sad. I was thinking about that twenty five k at the at the party poker that took place where he was playing Roger heads up, and <laughs> they were putting on a damn show in terms of taking to the streets and, and making plays. And, and Steve was showing uh, essentially no fear in a lot of these spots. And I was like, man, these hands would be really fun if people got to watch them, but. Didn't seem like anyone was chatting about those hands either. And it's just like we have some of these top players in the world with some of the best results in the world. And, and they just, you know, the hands that they play that are really fun, that are memories or moments don't get out there. So it's kind of unfortunate for somebody like a Steve who seems to be playing at a super high level that, you know, th those moments aren't showcased for him. I think he's, I mean, he's on like the EPT streams and like he's done great in Macau. But yeah, maybe he doesn't get as much airtime is like these other guys. Uh, he would be someone to make a point to go out and watch, uh, especially if you got him at like a soft table. I've seen him pull off some magic. Hmm. Chinchilla's God, God damn it. Dan Smith and Joe Ingram, the two sexiest men in poker. Now, <laughs> I think we might be getting carried away when it comes to me being one of the sexiest men in poker, but I'm more to have put Dan on the list and I need, I would need to go over that list more, but I don't know. There's some, there's some, yeah, some ugly guys, some good looking guys. You know, there's a nice mixture of all everything in the poker world right now. I think. I would agree with you. <laughs> Sick Handle says the week, this week of podcast should be called the podcast of legends. Listen, we can go with that for sure. You know, sometimes we're going to get, uh, we're going to get, actually we had the party poker millions that third guy, the kid who got third place, a 21 year old, the young, the young Slovenian guy who uh, has the best bankroll manager of anybody I've ever met. In my entire life, we had him on earlier this week. So. I feel weird that I didn't play. It was the biggest online tournament of all time. I didn't even play. It felt weird. 
Why didn't you? Yeah. Why didn't you play 5K? Not not too. Uh, you just didn't want to leave the country, or what was it? It was in between. It was like just before this. I had a lot going on in San Francisco. I was busy with the charity project. Uh, I just didn't really feel like flying somewhere to play online uh, for a couple of days. Just didn't really. I, at that moment, I didn't really have the time for it. So, what do you think about the idea of this? Was the biggest online poker tournament of all time? Twenty million guaranteed. 2.7 million up top. The two players chopped it for 2.4 million. And the young 21 year old kid who satellite in for $5 got that third place for 1.3. Bro, this kid, right? We had him on the podcast. He was literally living in like a, a what I believe to be a, a typical standard Slovenian apartment, one bedroom. Like, you know, I don't know what it's just a, a regular old humble kid who plays football. And now he's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to save this money up now and, and maybe take a couple of trips or two. I'm like, this is, it's crazy to see this kind of thing happen, man. Still in 2018. God, I love seeing the story of somebody running it up. That's like still the poker dream, which is getting harder and harder. Well, I guess that's just not really a run it up. That's just a like slam out a big tournament, but even still like $5 to 2 million is super cool. Uh, also would just love to give party poker credit. They're, this live tournament was super ambitious. I was absolutely sure that they were gonna get like mangled on overlay. They pulled it together. And these live stops are doing are wonderful too. Good for them. So we, let's go, let's get to the charity drive that you mentioned a few times here. Double up charity drive, double up drive, I believe it's called, right? Double up drive? Double up drive.com. Um, uh -oh. I was looking for my patches, but I don't have it. But yeah, double up drive.com. So a lot of players were wearing patches during the stream. Some players, I believe Dan Grano, I think some other players, not specific on who those players are. They pledged some of their winnings towards uh, the double up drive. Uh, Me, obviously we saw Angelo, Angelo and Daniel, Daniel and Steven Chidwick. Uh, he's donating a large amount of money. He decided he didn't want to like be playing. He didn't want to be gambling with charity funds, um, which is, I decided not to go that route. I decided to play for $15,000 worth. Um, but I totally respect his opinion and especially, uh, uh, but yeah, those were, the, um, oh, and Daniel Negreanu ended up playing for 10%. I don't know if we yeah, just- I saw he tweeted, yeah, I saw he tweeted that out after. Generous. Once he had already like tripled up in the tournament too. Um, and then uh, some other people I am hopeful will uh, get involved. But what the double up drive is, is a group of us picked out 10 of what we believe to be the most efficient charities in the world mm -hmm. uh, across like a wide spectrum of things from malaria nets to uh, like strong minds, which is a uh, group therapy for women in Uganda that has a 72% success rate of treating depression wow. to like AI safety. Um, really there's like a whole a big variety of them. Uh, so I'm hopeful that there's something for almost everyone. If you find a cause that you're passionate about, you could donate to the drive and our group of matchers will, um, will double it. So your impact goes up. And I think by doing it publicly, we encourage lots of other people to get involved who might not. Studies show that if you donate one year, you're 50% to donate the next year. So getting people in the door, I think is important. And just reminding them that our, like our world has access to kind of a ridiculous amount of money. It's like a strange bubble. So I think it's good to remind people that they could make big differences. Um, it inspired Fedor Holtz last year to donate 250K, Stephen Chidwick making a big donation this year. Uh, I'm very proud of the drive. And if anyone likes um, to get involved, no donation amount is too small doubleupdrive.com. So 10 guys doubling up what people donate. Who are the 10? Is it, is it? Oh, no, no. There's 10 charities. Um, it's myself, uh, Stephen Shidwick and uh, Matt Ashton, who is the uh, mixed game player. Uh, one of the best. Um, but, uh, he had a, he plays the Bobby's Room game. He plays big on stars, and I'm blanking on what his star's name is. But he's like, if you follow those games, you definitely know who he is. And then there's a few of the DFS guys, Tom and Martin Crowley and Aaron Mershak. 
So uh, who's, who's doubling, doubling it up? Is it you doubling it up? Uh, our group of six people. Oh, um, okay. So they're all, the, so it's all the group. So okay. We pooled our money together. Um, it was, uh, this was the first year when I felt, uh, and it just become a very big project. So it's, it's been cool to watch it grow. And as far as divvying up a million dollars and deciding which charities go in, I think it went unbelievably smoothly. Uh, I'm happy with it for sure. I mean, it feels like it's only getting bigger and bigger and bigger every single year because you've been doing this now for the past few years. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned Tom Crowley, who's a DFS player. Those guys are brothers, Chipotle Addict and Papa Gates. Chipotle Addict, before the big tournament series happened, he pledged 50% of his winnings. And then he won about two point some million dollars. So he donating one point some million. I mean, first of all, Dan, how much fucking money does this guy have? Okay. Because you're donating... I mean one million dollars from your from your score in in the biggest i think that was the biggest event at dfs year that seems crazy I think when he said it the way that he approaches it is he wants to donate 50 percent of his income to good cause like to good causes which i think is unbelievably commendable and like more generous than me by a fair bit um so yeah but he's he is still profiting like a million dollars himself Man. A million dollars. He won two million dollars. He's giving one million of that to charity. That's, yeah. I mean, man, I just, that's one of the craziest things I, I've seen. I, I mean, it is super crazy. I have never done anything that generous. So I don't want to take away from that. That is like 10 out of 10. It's 12 out of 10. It's unbelievable. Um, I think most people severely overestimate how much money you need to be set for life. And like, once you're at that point, like, I don't know, say you have a couple million dollars. How does your quality of life change if you get to 10 million, you know? Yeah. Um, I think once you are very comfortable, it's severe diminishing returns. You could, I think some people think like, oh, I don't care about other people all that much. It's not, I think people underestimate how how much like the some big donors might care but i kind of think of it as okay i might not care like of course people care about their loved ones similar to themselves um some cases more than themselves and then with this stranger of course it's not nowhere close to one to one but is it 10 to 1 is it do you care about them like 1 100th 1 1000th one, one and there there is a point when it's like okay if you for these people at all that maybe for 65 cents a day, you could support someone in Uganda. Once you have all of your needs met and you're living like a truly wonderful life, taking care of like these strangers, I think uh, becomes a very compelling options, both for what I believe to be the moral thing to do. And then also just from personal, like satisfaction of life, making a huge difference in the world. Like when you, I think when I look back on what I've done in my life, making a huge difference in the world is one of the most satisfying things that you could do. So from like purely a selfish, self-interested sort of way, I think using my money to help others is like one of the most fulfilling things I could be doing. What do you think about the idea of using that money for people that you might know in your life in terms of helping them out, whether that's family or friends and instead of giving that to strangers and, and have you faced any resentment from people that you might know in your lives who feel like they do need some help or could use some help and they don't get that help from you? I think, I mean, generally your money will go like a hundred times further in like various African countries, but of course I will helped out like my special, uh, my, I have like a, a small circle of people that I'll do like absolutely whatever it takes for their well being, not caring if it's like a dollar efficient thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the most part outside of that, like very small circle, um, I would not really give out handouts. Um, I would say maybe there's been a tiny bit of resentment, but if you and I are 
just like moderately good friends and you ask me for a loan and I choose not to and like you hold it against me, I kind of think that's more on you than it is on me. Right. But of course, like friends and family, like helping out your loved ones, I think is super important. And I like I value them at like very close to one to one to my own happiness and well being and all that sort of thing. And with like a stranger, maybe I would consider it like one to a hundred, you know? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I feel like, uh, especially with the publicity of the drive and, and how much it's you're, you post about it and put it out there. And I could imagine there might be some people in life who, I mean, I think mainly I would, I would consider this more of a family or people that feel like that you might owe them something, which I don't know how many people that might be for you personally. I have a pretty small family. Um, okay. And it, um, it hasn't really come up and there have been a few situations when I had the opportunity to help loved ones and I was super happy to do it. That makes sense. I just know I've some, I've had some dealings with my family in the past where if I did something like this on a public level, they would be very triggered with me that, and whether it would be to my face or behind my back, more behind my back than to my face. And this has happened before. This is how I know this would happen again is that. You know, yeah, they would look at it. Well, if he's got this money and giving this away, why didn't he give it to me? Like, I'm over here. I'm not, you know, we're struggling with this. We're trying to pay for this. We're trying to pay for that. So, yeah, that would be something I'd be curious to see how you how you would deal with or how if you've dealt with that. So it's, it's it sounds good. You haven't dealt with that too much. Has come up very little. Um, I sometimes get requests to support other people's causes. And really the thing I found like the most disheartening would be on Twitter when someone's just like, Hey, my child is, mm -hmm. is dying this and that. Can you support them? And then it, it's just like, Hey, I'm not taking on new causes right now. And like, not to sound heartless. And I, I will never tell this person who reaches out, but it's like, well, I could help like if it's $3,000 to like, generally that's the statistic to save somebody's life. In some cases, um, in some cases, when people reach out for help, it's like, well, the money is actually not going to do very little. Maybe it'll only buy you some more time. Uh, mm -hmm. That is what I find the hardest, though. And people like they send you the GoFundMe, and it has like the picture, oh, yeah. the gory picture of, and it's just like, ah, I don't want to see this. And or I'll, I'll occasionally get like messages like, oh my god, I can't pay my bills. I'm well, I, I listen. I'm a I'm a lot less sympathetic to those because well, I know, I've had a couple like, people message me like, "Dan, I'm considering. I read your post on mental health. I can't pay my bills. I'm considering killing myself." And I'm like, "I really that's yeah, yeah. devastating." And I send them a message like, "Here's a yeah, yeah. call if you're in like a time of crisis." But what like, and then I, I mean, that that that's that's tough. That's that's I don't I I don't I personally have not, do not believe I've gotten a message that's that I'm gonna kill myself more of. Can you just give me fucking money and my response is always, I don't really respond, but I also get a lot of GoFundMe's, a lot of charity drives, a lot of, can you put me in touch with Bill Perkins? I, I <laughs> want to do this or listen, I get, I get so many people must me to put me them in touch with Bill Perkins and, uh, great dude. I mean, listen, it makes, I'd want to be in touch with Bill Perkins too. I, if I was somebody. I party with Dan Bilzerian and Bill Perkins on his yacht for free. Can you set that up, Joey? I'm kidding. I don't know if they're still party. I think, I think, I think, uh, I think BP's BP's retired from the Bilzerian party lifestyle with uh, now that he's in he's been in love for a while with Lara. So they see. Remember a couple of years ago, I, uh, cousin Matt was was around. When I was doing the podcast. Yep, remember shots, cousin Matt. Me, cousin Matt, and Perkins did some partying in Barcelona this year. Really, cousin Matt yeah. was there. The mix, huh? <laughs> I brought him to Barcelona. He was a big star. Uh, also, like Perkins and Matt definitely hit it off. It was it was cool to see. How did Matt enjoy the whole Barcelona? I mean, be, going to Barcelona with you, and never mind, going to Barcelona with you, going to Barcelona itself, that's one thing. I feel like going to Barcelona with you is going to be a little different experience for, for Cousin Matt. So he's only 23, and there were times when like, I, I was like talking about, like, yeah, I'm not really going to be partying. And he just like called me out while we were there. We, we had some wild nights. It was a lot of fun. And uh, it was cool that we got to like bond in Barcelona. He's like a real, he's like one of the funnest people to go out with. Uh, Super extroverted, social, yeah. uh, talking to everybody. We did some karaoke, and he was a big star at that. Uh, 
What do you what do you think makes somebody? I've thought about this question a ton, so I thought I, I, my favorite question now. That's probably not my favorite question, but what do you think makes somebody fun to go out partying with? Good question. Um, some people are just like generally positive and think whatever they're doing is kind of the best thing. Um, he was good at like setting up logistics and finding people, and I think when partying is really fun, like you get two groups that combine to like make like a bigger party. Mm -hmm. He was really good at going out and finding other people to, to party with. And he would just like link up with people and just like immediately seem to have these connections. Um, I think that's a good question. I don't think I gave you a good answer, but I will think about it more and get back to you on that. Well, I'll give you some things I've thought about because okay. I, uh, I pride myself on being somebody that's a, a great to go out with any single time, whether it's a, and I think it has to do with being just easygoing and willing to have a good time, no matter the environment or who you're with or what kind of music you're listening to or where you're at. And obviously there'll be some exceptions to that, but just someone that keeps a general positive attitude, isn't complaining about the surroundings and the situation and trying to bring up the people around you through their energy or dancing or smiling or attitude in general. So Whenever I try to go out, I try to bring like a really good vibe to the table and I'm always dancing a lot, which I love dancing too. So like you dance and smile and you drink and you you try to bring people up. I think that's what makes Positivity it. Positivity is really contagious. And when other people are having fun, the mood just uh, enhances. And you know what? The, the group definitely wins when you're dancing. So I think you answered that question way better than I did. Kudos. Yeah, I've just thought, because I thought like what makes somebody good at a nightclub? Because I love going to the nightclub and at, at a table, what makes someone fun at a table? And usually it's the person that's dancing and, and having a good time and pumping other people up and finding them girl. I mean, listen, you know, got to find them some girls too, because everybody yeah, wants a good wingman out there. It really does revolve around guys trying to meet women. Uh, I almost never go to nightclubs anymore, actually. Yeah. I, uh, I, I really only go, I go there with my friends for the most part. I haven't really gone out with the intention to meet people or women for maybe like two years now. And when that does happen, it just, listen, it's the club, Dan, you meet people sometimes. It happens, oh, totally. You know? You look to your left, you got beautiful woman to your left, beautiful woman to your right. Shout out Phil Helmuth. I'm not married. I'm gonna talk to him. I'm not Phil Helmuth. I'm not gonna run to the bathroom and then scoot away in my limo because I don't wanna I don't wanna be out of line. That's one of my favorite stories from Phil Helmuth that he told me on the podcast. That was strong. What did you say? That was really strong. I know. He's like, listen, Joey, I got a beautiful woman to my right, beautiful woman to my left. I'm sitting there, I'm looking in her eyes, we're having a close connection. I can feel myself getting to that point. So I go to the bathroom. And then I get in my limo. I get out of that place. I don't want to make any mistakes. I say, okay, I mean, it's a reasonable approach, I believe. It's something. Yeah. It's something, man. Let me get some shout outs. I see my man, Andreas Froelich, Froley, Andreas Froley Poker, who uh, always leaves timestamps in my, and I'm going to start doing more timestamps, guys. But Andreas also has a YouTube channel. Go check his stuff out. He plays the great game. Pop Minoma, Pop Minoma player himself, too. So, we got a lot of love for him out there in the chat. Who else we got in here right now? I see my man Clip Slip, Kip Slip, Kip Slip out there too. I saw Scott Sheen. Joey, please shout me out in the pod. What's up, puppy? But you also balance that with fuck you're so hot, Joey. So I don't know where you're coming from with this angle, but it worked. You got a shout out. What's happening, brother? Raina Bahawal. This is the new Joey. I like the this recent Joey because of his positivity. As Dan mentioned earlier, it's all a matter of perspective in terms of staying positive or staying negative on things. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely back to my more new old me. New old me. New year, new me. That's about it. So Trevor Fono out there, always leaving some weird fucking comments. What's going on, Trevor? How's it going? JR. Who else is there? Is that Joey's tank top Dan's wearing? No, that's Dan's tank top Dan's wearing, I believe. This was an EDC tank from a couple years ago. Yeah, it's uh, into the AM, right? Oh, that... I don't know what that means, but it has this little unicorn on it. That might be the brand. Yeah, I think that's into the um, – yeah, that one's pretty sick. Ba-bam. Dare I say, G, T, O. I, I like it a lot. I only have like two or three tank tops, so. Well, listen, I came out in a hoodie, and I saw you were in the tank, and I you know, I, I instantly went to the bedroom and changed. So I'm uh, – you got me back in spirit. I haven't been wearing tank tops as much. I found out it's just less polarizing when you just wear hoodies. Like you, you don't – you're not gonna offend anyone straight off the bat. Whereas if I'm in a tank top, they're like, oh, there's fucking cocksuckers in a tank top. You know, Who's I, gonna get offended. Like if someone gets offended over you wearing a tank top, like who cares about their opinion? I mean, I I don't, but at the same time, they're cop they're like this this drives their impression of the podcast is I'm wearing a tank top. Like, oh well, I mean, he's this, you know, they just they, they view 
the perception they have if they don't know much about you or even if they do know about you because you have the tank top on is just uh I don't know, man. The tank top. They don't like the tank top. Some people out there. Scott F. Also in the chat, guys. Nick's in the chat. Buck Robinson. Arthur Campos. He's always out there, man. Kush Strain. My guy, Kush Strain. What up, Kush? What's happening, brother? Reworked muscle. What's happening, buddy? Damn, hard ignored. No worries, guys. We didn't ignore you, buddy. Don't worry, muscle. Keep reworking that muscle, brother. Scott F. R.A. Nick. I think I might have already said you guys out there. We got some questions on Twitter. Let's run through them real quick here. From uh, Ben. Wolinovsky says, if you had stuck to chess instead of getting into poker, what rank slash rating do you think it would be now? I don't think I would be an exciting, a particularly exciting chess player. Um, maybe my peak would be 2,400, but I think it's also, do you know, do you, um, I think it's also possible I had close to plateaued. Like I'd played chess very competitively for eight years. Um, maybe with hard, you know, I'll guess 2,400. Maybe I could have been a bit better, but uh, chess is a tough game. Okay. I guess that kind of answers it. Uh, let's see. I, would not become, I was not, I don't think I would have ever been able to make a, a living playing chess. Okay. How many people are making a living playing chess? Do you think? I'm going to guess that like the top, seven or eight people are making a million dollars and then and i think there's like a very quick and big drop um i'm not super in touch with the scene anymore but growing up i would see like the 10th best chess player in the united states like struggling to pay his bills and like making like chopping chess tournaments in spots where like it was clearly like giving up a ton of EV to do so. Uh, I'm going to guess that there's like, I don't know, 50, um, 3,000 people making a living off of chess. But uh, I actually think the chess Twitch thing is blowing up. And I have literally no idea. If, are, like, are people making real money on Twitch? Yes. Okay, so there's a lot of people on... Oh, yes. ...on chess switch that are probably doing pretty well then okay yeah I mean, like, what do you think sort of hourly people are doing it's a good question i mean i haven't really paid attention to what the subscriber count is for a lot of people out there but i mean i know it seems like lex feldhouse has a lot of subscribers so if you have ten thousand subscribers you're making at least twenty five thousand a month off just subscribers oh, okay. yeah so 250 men some people get a better deal, not to mention the ad rev that's going to come from that and if you're streaming long hours and you run more ads than most people do, you can certainly add up pretty quickly. So, yeah, I mean, there's some guys that are fucking crushing out there in, in other industries. Good for them. Yeah, it's pretty sick. I mean, listen, you sh stream all day long. It's not easy. So to be able to monetize that and and make money from it and, and support yourself for a living, it's a new age. And I think that's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because who wants to go work at a job, but you can be at home, stream on your computer, playing video games or playing whatever game that you want to play. Yeah, for sure. So... Uh, David Nostradamus says the one player you don't want to be heads up with for a million dollars. Ike. Ike Hollywood Haxton. Yeah. Okay. Great heads up player. Good at the live element. Not afraid at any stakes. Uh, what do you think about the nickname? For, well. What do you, what do you say? I think it's kind of, uh, I feel pretty adamant about that answer as well. Hollywood hacks and striking the fear of God into people. I mean, he just played more heads up than like almost anyone, right? Yeah. Still good to see him around, kicking around, still battling at the high stakes, still getting after it. And you're right, he, that that elusive tur big score on like this big stage, it seemed to elude him. And, and now he sort of has that. And I don't think he needed that validation from us or from himself to feel a certain way about his own accomplishments. But it has to feel pretty good to finally have that big score and say, like, listen, I'm not, you know, this is where I am. This is where I stand. And, and I'm, I'm debatably one of the best players, if not the best player in the world right now. He loves poker so much, too. Uh, it's cool to see someone who truly loves it win. Um, and I, he's not going anywhere. He's going to be doing this forever. He's not retiring anytime soon? No. Um, I mean, 
I wouldn't be surprised if like today he just ends up there's a big mixed game today at Bellagio. I wouldn't be surprised at all. If, like twenty was it yes a day and a half after the super high roller bowl, he's just out there playing. I don't know if it's fifteen three or three six, but he'll be back in that mix soon for sure. Are you playing any of that mix too? The three that 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 mix game? I am not nearly good enough to play that big. Um my mixed skills are pretty lacking. Like I hopped into the 50k this year. Solid third, solid third place, brother. Not too, not too. Shy. I was thrilled with it. It was super fun. <laughs> um, it's totally possible that I was not a favorite in the field. Uh, I went through a phase a couple of years ago where I was trying to learn the mixed games, but I'm still super raw. Um, I just thought it'd be a fun thing to do, and like winning the players' championship, I think is like behind like winning the main event is maybe the biggest accomplishment in poker. So I, I want to give myself that chance every year. Who, 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 my voice is actually going away right now. Who won that event? <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah. Who won that event? You got third. Yeah, who won? Grinder won it for the third time. What an animal. <laughs> yeah. What a fucking animal, man. That's awesome. Uh, we got a question, a newbie question here, reworked muscle. I've been playing for three months and played 10 tournaments, cash four of them. I'm playing in 100,000 guaranteed today, day two on Sunday. What recommendation do you have for a new player, both cash and tournament? So recommendations for a new player on day two of a tournament? Probably just a new player in general to cash oh. and tournaments. Probably not necessarily specific to, to day two or not. Okay. Um, try to make sure you're having fun. If it, you're not enjoying it, why are you doing it? Um, I would try to get a good night's sleep and maintain composure while playing. And mm -hmm. you are going to mess up hands. Really, all you could do is try your best to make good decisions. If you make a decision wrong, it's just part of it. I mess up hands on a daily basis. Um, so, yeah, I would just say try your best and have fun and a good night's sleep and some good prep in the morning can make a lot of difference. Maybe a little priming your mind as well, too. You know, I'm not a, I've been kind of coming around more on the idea of mindfulness after talking with uh, Maria, you know, Maria is sponsored by Poker Stars now. I feel like she's always got such uh, such great, great wisdom on when it comes to mindfulness. And it's something I've been trying to do more of this year and haven't got quite gotten to meditation yet, but I hear it from so many people that it just can't be a bad idea to just, I actually, I did do some meditation before my 10K PLO event this year. And uh, whether it's coincidence or not, I don't know, but I did really well on that. And I felt really great. I felt good. I felt focused the entire tournament. So, I mean, I, I don't know. It's a small sample size for me in tournaments. I don't play many, but I did feel like that preparation before I went to go play really helped me be in a, a, a better focused mindset. I could, it's like a very palpable difference for me. And it's even a situation where like, I could be having like a, a very foggy day where I'm just like not thinking that clearly. And meditation might make a huge difference. Couldn't couldn't suggest enough that everyone try it. Think PLO, what's up? Think PLO, Poppy, what's that? PLO, PLO, PLO. Dan, you playing PLO much lately at all, or any of the great game? The great game been calling your name. I've played a little bit of PLO cash games this summer, but a small amount. I play the PLO tournaments, but uh, I've played a lot less PLO this year. Why is that? I'm um, just been, been busy with no limit. They keep adding all of these like bigger tournaments, um, and there's just not that many PLO tournaments to play. Uh, generally, if there's a twenty-five thousand dollar no limit tournament going on, which it seems like there's been going around the clock as of the last year, that's where I want to spend my energy. Perfect. They're really neglecting the great game. I'll tell you that right now. More and more tournaments popping up everywhere. All sorts of stakes. PLO, maybe they'll throw a 3K in there. We'll give them a 3K. Let's get, let's, yeah, it makes sense. I don't know. It is what it is. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is. It's going to take a real, I got to go on a really, 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 really hardcore effort if I really want to make any sort of a change in the PLO ecosystem, I feel like, because, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it really. It seems like Nolan Holmes actually getting more popular right now. And kind of thinking about the future of tournaments with all of these high stakes tournaments, where do you see the future of, tournament poker going to i think the high roller uh, scene is doing better than it's ever been before um 
it doesn't seem like there's a shortage of people willing to pony up the big buy-in. So I think the next few years for tournaments are going to be very good. Mm. Uh, I think if you're one of the best in the world with like a big bankroll, it's the best time there's ever been to be a professional poker player. So you think if you're one of the best, you say that word time so I can, I can make if sure. You're I one of the that. best poker players in the world with a big bankroll. It's the best time it's ever been to be a professional hold'em player. Professional hold'em player. So is that tournaments, cash games, or, or or both? Both, but favoring tournaments. Like it's not easy to get into the big cash games, but uh, being well versed if those situations do come up, mm -hmm. that could be a lot of EV. I don't know. It used to be a couple of years ago you'd play one or two million in buy-ins. In 2019, I predict that the person who plays the highest volume plays like eight or nine million dollars in buy-ins. Wow. And whatever ROIs you want to say with that, multiply like, I don't know, 10% by nine million. That's a lot of EV. Interesting statement. Yeah, that's something I have not heard. I mean, you know, we get a lot of people on here talking about how, uh, you know, online poker might not be at a health or poker, sorry, online poker, it's a different story, but poker might not be in the best state or anything like that. And uh, whereas well, you're it's saying a small that group of people who I think are really peaking, but if you're one of the top like 15 players, I if, think so if you're one of the top 15 players or one of those top players, then it's never been better. Yeah. Okay. What do you think about the other, uh, one point some billion players who don't fall in the top 15. What do, what do you think about for those guys? I am not very well versed in that. So um, I think playing like smaller tournaments, traveling around, like the expenses are really brutal to deal with. Yeah. I think there's probably like a good 10, 20 game almost everywhere or maybe five ten, but it's just not as like, you can't be making, crazy money playing 5 10 and 10 20. like this, um but i will say i'm not super i mean i guess like there's still a bunch of epts and then like you if you're playing like 5 and 10 k's with some 25 and 50 k's uh i think online tournaments are also doing like uh doing very well but i'm gonna admit that i don't really know anything about that scene you know, it seems like there is a lot of uh, Nolan Holm cash games around town, one, two, and two, five specifically. So I just see, listen, there, there's hundreds of one, two games here. I don't know about more than two, over 200, but there are, every casino has a, it seems like there is a lot of live poker going on here in Vegas right now. So I would imagine with that many games going on, there's going to be some really great spots for you to make a living, whether it's, you're not going to make a ton of money in terms of hundreds, thousands of dollars in these games, but you can certainly build up your bankroll and your skill and your ability to potentially move up, start traveling a little bit and get yourself out there. So whether it's for cash games and, and, and building up at tournaments, that's a different story because there's so much selling action and so much markup and those sorts of things that navigate that, that you have to navigate to make you a successful tournament player that I'm not as well informed on that situation, but it does seem to me that there are more and more tournament stops. There's more and more series during the summer. You have multiple different casinos running multiple different series with some great value in there. So it does seem like for live poker, there is a lot of opportunity for cash game and tournament players alike all over the world. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, not good if you're an online cash game background player, Dan, and you're, uh, you're you're pl you're grinding in the streets that still exist out there. I always but... hear that like there's secret online action. There's these Chinese apps, uh, yeah. but I'm not very informed about them. I mean, basically, a lot of the action spread out amongst the Chinese apps, amongst the, uh, the 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 PP poker clubs right now, amongst the browser sites right now. And then there are some players who are playing on the GG pokers at the high stakes or the globalpoker.coms or the poker seems uh, to be thriving. I don't. I've never played there, but. It's, I don't know. It seems like they're getting, they're running like multiple 5Ks per day. Kudos. Oh, which GG Poker? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bryn Kenny's a, a bastard for there. And I know, Bryn, I talk about the high rake at PLO and it's being uncapped and I don't like it. But I do have to admit that, uh, you know, Bryn's doing a great job. In terms of being uncapped, Dan. Do you know how many percent? Uh, I think it's five or 10, but I'm not, not 100% okay, sure. Okay. Yeah. That's egregious. Yeah. yeah. That's like live poker stuff, back room. That is back room. I, I completely agree with you. I agree. Now, Bryn's argument, and Bryn can get in touch with me because I talked about this recently. 
And I got a lot of, by the way, I got a lot of respect for someone that reached out to you and they got a fucking issue about something you said, or they want to go back and forth on something, even just a conversation about things. So shout out to Bryn because I mentioned the no cap rake and he got in touch with me. We exchanged a lot of messages back and forth with each other. And I understand from, from meeting with GG poker and kind of understand where they're coming from. And I think they're creating a really nice ecosystem for tournaments and their software is really, really great. And the normal hold'em cash game rake is different, but there's some games on there. But for PLO being on cap rake, I'm never going to be able to support that. Even if th there are really bad players who are playing and the win rates are, are higher and you can maybe beat that. I, I just don't think it's sustainable for many players to be able to win in an environment where the rake's uncapped. I agree. Yeah. So it's uh good and bad. It is what it is, Dan. It's online poker these days. So you take the good with the bad and you try to make the best of it. So did I have another question on here? Actually, yeah. A couple questions on Twitter here. Craig Farrell, Bobby's Room Stories. Dan, people love stories on here. They love stories, Dan. Any Bobby's Room Stories you can give the people out there, whether it's a positive, negative, big pot, degen moment, in line, out of line? Um, nothing's really coming to mind. I feel like I went through some stories last time I played, so I don't want to repeat myself. But, um, I mean, yeah, there's some, like, characters – um but nothing's coming to mind unfortunately do you have any uh degen stories dan when i was in japan two years ago uh we were a group of us were drinking and then it turned into drinking and gambling um the stakes really we were like playing dice like taking turns being the house in at uh craps and these two dudes were just playing huge on like outrageously big on the side, like flipping like 50, 100K a pop. Um, I ended up getting in there and I ended up winning a quarter million, a quarter million dollars shooting dice. And we ended up doing a lot of the dice at a strip club. What? Uh, <laughs> wait, what? This changed. Okay. Wait a second. All right. Uh, yeah, we weren't really paying that much attention. Like we had like a bunch of champagne and the girls were like, oh, let's get dances. And like, we were like, no, we're, we're throwing dice right now. Um, I won a quarter million dollars and these other two dudes betting on the side were playing way bigger than me. Uh, so that's the most evident thing I've ever been a part of. How, how does this dice in the strip club work? Is it like you guys are in a circle sort of uh, wires, the wire style or what, what's like the dice set up here? Uh, battleship, like people are facing each other. There was like a little, Maybe it was like a backgammon set where you'd like throw the dice in in there. What um, are we? What are we? Are we calling number? Like, are we betting on number? How are we doing the dice? The dice game. Uh, people were taking turns being the house at craps, so you could say okay. pass, don't pass, um, and then occasionally, like you could take odds or like some number stuff. Uh, that was the most degenerate thing I've ever done in a Japanese strip club. In a Japanese strip club, yeah. <laughs> Was there sushi present in the Japanese? Was the, what's the food options like in the Japanese strip club, Dan? There were no food options. It was actually, it was a very un-Japanese strip club. Uh, but I mean, it, were, it was it was pretty dope. A lot of champagne. We went. We might have gone through all of their champagne. All of the strip. So, how what what time do we end the dice game? What time is it? Six early in the morning, or how how long does the dice game go for? I think I tapped out at around 7 a.m. Right, naturally, okay. Uh, and I was not the last person still going. Did they feel like you hit and ran them in the dice game? Because you're, you're no, up in the... I felt like I hit and ran. I, it was a, it was a marathon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, roulette stories? And I mean, I know you play roulette, so Do you I have don't... any uh, DJ yeah. roulette stories? Um, people seem to really enjoy these DJ stories and okay. especially I'm gonna tell roulette stories. this roulette story. And then I have a, someone on Twitter posted a charity question. Okay. okay. Um, which charity I, question? Okay. Andrew Barber asked me, how do I choose the non give well charities? Um, mostly through a project called okay. open philanthropy, which is a give well spinoff and a bit through, uh, uh, if we're going to include a project, um, I'll reach out to 
What? <laughs> Why are you laughing? At me? I love, I love how, I love how we were, we were talking at the DJ, the DJ story. Okay, I'm gonna I gotta get this cherry. Story. Listen, Dan, yeah. you are more than welcome to get, get to all the charity stuff that, that questions that you see out there for sure, man. Um, mostly through Open Philanthropy, who's a Give Well spinoff, and they have like a little bit of a wider range of like topics that they cover. And I also am a big believer in just like calling the people up on the phone or like meeting them for coffee or dinner and getting to know somebody face to face. Um, so for the charities you choose, you'll you'll reach out to them, have a conversation with them, even meet up with them and kind of see what kind of people they're like and try to get a feel for them in person. Totally. Yeah. I think yeah. having um, a strong vibe is important. Or if I, with like the Bell Funds, uh, Foxwoods Fiend, uh, Ariel, he's someone I'll always reach out to to get his opinion. So I try to go to someone who I think is an expert in the field and get their opinion. Shout out to Andrew Barber for that question. Okay, so DJ, I don't play roulette anymore. I think it's, if I'm gonna play a pit game. It's craps. Almost always gonna be craps. JC loves Baccarat, and I'll occasionally do that like in Macau, but I don't even know how to properly sweat the cards, but I have had a couple epic Baccarat sessions. Um, but when I was 18, I came to Vegas for a week. I was staying on Sean Deeb. Oh wait, um, I'm mixing up stories. But when I was 18, I stayed with Sean Deeb, uh, Ray Coburn, Exit Only, who became like an end boss at DFS, and Thayer. I just realized it was like a year later that I, um, I came back to Vegas. I was 19. Uh, with some people I knew from the chess world. Um, I'd spun up a bunch of money actually playing heads up versus Ike on cake poker. I won like 50K at 2550. Um, and I, of course, I didn't know it was him, but that's what happened. Uh, won a bunch, quit. We decided we were going to go rage, and we went to XS. And that was like a r unbelievably crazy weekend. Um, first, before we went into the club, there was this setup. We were playing roulette, and my buddy was playing. And I just got, like, I was 19 in Vegas for the first time. I was just, like, blacked out out of my mind. I just basically kept yelling to my buddy, like, same bet, same bet. I didn't realize that I was on the hook for, like, 35K on a red or black. We hit it. But, like, the stakes really got like unbelievably ridiculous. So we won that number finally. So then we went to go celebrate at XS. Um, and I almost, uh, me and a friend, we were leaving with these uh, two Asian girls and some dude comes up to us and he, he tries to steal the girls from us first. And the girls were just not having any of it. And then he ends up, saying some like really awful racist shit and i lost my temper on the dude and i like got in his face and just started yelling at him and this was like this dude was a monster he was huge and jacked and like he was clearly trying to start something he like took his drink he like went to throw it at me like i ducked it but uh it, like hit my friend um uh, there's like a shouting match going on uh, my friend ends up shoving him and then like 10 security guards come and like break everything up. We're getting kicked out of the win. Of course, we've lost, lost the girls by this point. So they're like, this is a train wreck. We're not going to be a part of it. Um, as security is escorting me out, they're like, you idiot. That was a professional UFC fighter. And then in retrospect, I think what the dude was trying to get happen was he was trying to get me to, to swing on him because he's not allowed to start a fight, but if it's self-defense, you're allowed to defend yourself. So he was like saying this awful shit, he threw the drink. Uh, it would have been really bad for me. It would, uh, like a, I mean, any UFC fighter would absolutely destroy me. But this, unfortunately, I forget who it was. I didn't watch UFC at the time, but I would say that's my most DJ roulette story. <laughs> out of line, my friend, out of line. I mean, it could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse. I mean, could have been a lot worse. 
19 to like 23 year old Dan in Vegas was just like on a warpath for, for destruction. Yeah, I can see that. And now 29 year old Dan, a little bit more at peace and, and not quite on a, the warpath as much. Not so much. I mean, I feel like once you've done all the, at least for me, I feel like I've already done all of the, the club stuff. Now I just kind of, I'd much rather go to like a quietish bar, maybe like once a year, get the crazy club night in there. Mm. Nihal on Twitter says Nihal Advani still playing DFS. I gave up DFS. Um, not this season, but last season. I played like the first couple weeks. For me to pl uh, for me to play at the high level, I was just spending like thirty hours a week on it. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't really want to spend that time. And last year, when I was looking at it, I thought between so I guess it was three seasons ago, and I was playing a ton. Uh, I played like the first couple weeks last year, and I just realized that everyone had gotten to be gotten a lot better yeah my method for making picks wasn't that complicated so i just kind of figured it was only a matter of time before i couldn't really win anymore mm -hmm. and i was happy to like get that 30 hours a week back in my life did you end up a uh, overall winner playing dfs yeah a pretty big winner yeah i had a piece of aaron jones five million we swapped in the big tournament and like my own results were pretty good as well yeah, Aaron definitely. Uh, is Aaron still playing? A. A. Jones. He's still playing DFS. He's still playing. Yeah. yeah um, are they still are, are are guys like him and uh, Asani? Are they still considered some of the best guys? I am not really in the know anymore. Um, I think they are good, but not like the very best. Of course, I'm biased because like Aaron's the one who taught me how to play DFS. Right. But I thought Aaron was maybe the best at like no limit GPPs a couple years ago. Like there'd be a situation that comes up where it's like, oh, Antonio Brown is going to be like 35% owned. Um, so it's really a really chalky play. But on the other hand, he has like a really awesome matchup. I would found, find that to be one of the hardest parts of DFS. Whenever I would ping Aaron and ask him what he thought he should do, I thought he would have like a really good uh, both like field-based answer and like sometimes he would be able to quantify it. So I, I, and like when he did win the 5 million, I thought his like lineup that first week was like very, very clever. Uh, for someone in the chat said, what's DFS? DFS is daily fantasy sports where you pick individual players on a weekly or nightly basis. And, uh, and yeah, you, uh, you build up your points there. And basically it was pretty popular in America for a while. I had a DFS Sunday night show I did for Roto Grinder. Shout out to my guys at Roto Grinders over there. And uh, I, I didn't really play very often, but a lot of poker players like Dan were playing some of the higher stakes out there and they were firing pretty hard. And a lot of the top players were former poker players who transitioned over there and they become some of the guys that were the most feared players. But now I, it's not quite the same. The rake is really high and the edges are a lot smaller in terms of everybody getting better and in terms of all the content available out there and the predictors and information articles, people just getting better naturally over the years and so on. So I don't currently know exactly where the state of DFS stands, but it does seem like the buzz is died down a lot in terms of making money in, as a professional. I'm sure as a recreational player, it's people still love to play, but yeah, it's uh, doesn't seem doing like the show when I had my biggest ever week when I, Thomas Rawls went off, I think it was on the Seahawks. I won three seats to the draft Kings final that day. I think you were doing the show. Yeah, that was you did. Yeah. I remember that you had a pretty good, yeah, yeah, we won a quarter million dollars that day. That was a that's a good day. Yeah, DF, DFS was that was that was a fun time. And uh, I feel like DFS was right before crypto. It was like DFS, little time off, crypto craze. And now this year, what's been the thing this year? I guess crypto kind of died off in in March for the most part. It kind of I guess Fortnite maybe for a little bit of time. But what, what do we do we still feel like something replaced crypto that became the big buzz in terms of uh, maybe just amongst poker players or amongst the world? I guess. Nothing's coming to mind. Yeah, I feel like it was uh, crypto and then um, Fortnite and then maybe like, I don't know, non politic related, uh, Connor McGregor versus Habib. That was pretty big too. Just that, yeah. that, whole, that whole kind of situation right there. But outside of that, yeah. I mean, I feel like now there's so much more happening in the world that 
you don't necessarily have something become this really popular worldwide story amongst everyone because it's just things are so segregated amongst people have their own communities of gaming or of makeup or of the people bro have you seen this thing where they whisper into the microphone as like medita asmr i have seen it i don't get it i think it's kind of weird it's like a little bit of a is it a sexual thing I have apps. I don't know. I do know there's a 13 year old girl that does it who's popular. So I don't think she's going from a sexual standpoint. But I was on Twitch last night and there was this woman, like, I don't know what her nationality was. She was dressed in like a sexy red riding. I don't know what her cost. It was like a sexy costume. And she was making, it was the, she had like a double mics here and would like, I don't know what she was doing, but it was some of the freakiest shit I've ever heard. And, but it did, it was relaxing. So I saw one where the woman was eating a pickle. Okay, what's that for? Is that supposed no, to be it's, cool? She was doing, is it ASRM? ASMR, I, yeah, I don't know, man. Whatever it is, it was that thing, and she was also eating a pickle. Um, what? I think some percent of the population, when they hear these low noises, they get a physical sensation, but it's gotta be a little bit of a sexual thing, too. Which, I don't know, man, that's... You're into what you're into, but that, that seems... <laughs> Eating a pickle. Wait, did you actively seek this out or did you stumble upon this down a rabbit hole one day? Someone brought this up and I was like, I had never heard of this thing. I'm like, oh, we're gonna show you the video. And like so then like they, they were looking for like the most popular ones and one of no, them. Listen, I'm not I'm not saying I'm out, but I'm not saying I'm in either. I would need to see our Yeah, I need to see the woman eating the pickle eating the pickle first before I can if make you it. Google A S M R pickle, that would be uh, the same woman comes up. Okay, I'm going to right now. I almost want to play this on stream. Oh my god, what is this? Okay, I wow, this is a lot of downvotes. Seventy six thousand downvotes, twenty one million views. What the fuck is going on out here, Dan? Oh, her her name is ASMR the Chew. Oh my god. <laughs> I kind of can I should I play this for people out there? I, I think you should not. What you should whatever you want. You know what? You can play this. I'm gonna get some water. Why is this woman eating out of a pickle? Guys, you guys have to see this. Hold on a second. Let me let me find this real quick. Look at this. She literally talks in the whispers in the mic and then eats big crunches of pickles. But I can't turn the sound up though. Oh my god, no. Uh, what the f all right, I'm out. I'm done. That's it. I need to stop sharing that ASAP. Okay. I'm never going to watch this again. Not going to be able to do it. No, sorry, guys. You got some more shout outs out there while Dan's uh, taking care of business. My man, Adam, once again, Jason Spring. What's happening, man? Justin Fats. What's up, Justin? What's going on, brother? Zuby Combat Papi. Colamosa. Cara, cara, cara. What up, my man? Dankness, Big Daddy. Daddy Dank Will Jaffe. What up, Big Poppy? What's happening, man? Cocky, what up, Cocky? What's happening, brother? Rick Randozo. What up, Rick? What's going on, buddy? Welcome to the stream, guys. Daniel, not not even not a not a Let's get a couple more questions in here, Dan, then we will uh we'll wrap things up here. Uh Nelly Cover cover Nelly covers on his Twitter says advice for an aspiring two five live player trying to make side income from poker. Um, I think decide what it is you want out of poker. Make sure that you're enjoying it. If you're trying to make side income, I think that's, that's cool. Um, I'm not super in touch with those games. Um, I guess if you, I tweeted something similar, I would try to be very precise as to what, my goals were with poker and then it would make it easier to proceed if you're trying to like move up in stakes versus whether you just want to make like a couple extra thousand dollars to like go on a vacation your actions might be different so i would say clear goals and make sure you're enjoying it um if you're not having fun with it probably should be doing something else yeah i mean i think if you're not having fun playing poker when you're trying to make it you know, that's tough because I, I think for myself, I started playing <laughs> poker. I, I always enjoyed playing poker immensely. There was never a time where I was like, man, I don't want to play. I, I, every day I woke up 
even before I was professional, I wanted to play poker every single day. So if you're, I can't imagine playing and not enjoying playing. It's just that wouldn't, it's so hard to get yourself to that extra level of motivation to become great at the game if you don't like playing the game. Yeah. It's tough, man. Manual HM says, thoughts about Amadi 17 and how is it like to become so rich, so young playing poker? Uh, Adrian, Adrian Mateos, what are your thoughts on Adrian Mateos? We saw him final table, the super high roller bowl, and seems like he's uh, plays at a really high level, had a lot of success, and I was shocked to find out he was 24. I'm not sure why. I just he, I, he struck me as someone who appeared to be a little older than that. But yeah, what, what's kind of well, thoughts on him? Young guy he seems to like have his shit together. I'm like, right, he, exactly. That's what I, he didn't seem like he's you know a little that out of line. I like the guy. Um, always enjoy playing with him. He's clearly a great player. He's been getting it done. Um, he tries no matter what the stakes. Like it's pretty easy for some people. If they go from like a 300K to like smaller stakes to play sloppy and he just plays his hardest all the time. Great player. I'm a huge fan of the guy. You mentioned earlier on, or not earlier on Twitter, you mentioned uh, maybe uh, Poker Masters time, I believe you tweeted this out about Ali Imserovich, Ali Imserovich, who broke through and won Poker Masters and we saw him make a deep run, did we? We saw him final table this event. For uh, Super High Roller Bowl, what are your thoughts on a new player to the scene like Ali and also new player to the scene like an Alex Foxen who got second place in the event? I've played a lot more with Ali. Um, he seems tough, tricky. He's got moves. He's working hard. And like I said on Twitter, I do have a tre tremendous amount of respect for someone who could still move through the ranks today. I think in today's current landscape, I would have been very unlikely to pursue poker. So the fact that he went from like two cent, five cent on ACR like four years ago to now playing and winning in the biggest games, kind of respect. And I like the guy. I don't really know Foxen at all. Um, I've played with him only a little bit, but I know this was like his breakout year and he seems to be really crushing. Uh, I've almost never played with him and I don't know him though. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we don't know much about him except um, except that kind of what they said during the broadcast, which was he's dating Chrissy and he played football and he's a big guy and he's got an intense yeah, stare. That's all I learned. I learned three days. This is what I learned about second guy. And I, and I know we have mutual friends and he works with chip leader coaching and those are my guys over there. But he was wearing a hoodie, but sometimes when he's wearing a t-shirt, it's like, man, his biceps are just unbelievably ginormous. <laughs> The man's a big man. Let's put it like a big man yeah. for sure. But yeah, I've heard uh, one thing I've heard from my friends is he has a, a an incredible work ethic, and I'm sure that work ethic was applied to sports in the past, and now he's applied that work ethic to poker. And obviously, he ran well in some hands. I think he had a he had a, I can't remember the first that I posted that he had. I think he oh, fuck he had, he overboated Nikki P. I mean, that was the that was the one hand where he had kings. He three bet pre, I believe. He flopped top set king deuce four. Turn Deuce, River 10, and Nikki P had pocket 10s. And he also had Bottomo sticking 100 big blinds pre with Ace 4 when he had Kings as well, too. I don't know how yeah, that hand went down. Right but hand down. Um, it was, do you remember if it was a low jack button big blind? Can't remember. There, it, it just, they went to the table. They, they were at outer table and they went to the table for my recollection. So I don't exactly know how the action went down and how Ace 4 from Justin got 100 big blinds in pre. I think it was. I think he raised in the low jack. Maybe Ike called in the cutoff or the button and Fox in three bet out of the big blind. Um, and then he, he four bet shoved. Oh, wow. I think, okay. I think it's just too many chips, uh, too weak of a hand. Like, I probably wouldn't go all in with any hand for more than 100 blinds there. I think you can maybe make an argument for it. But if you were doing it, Ace Four suited is not the hand I'd be looking to do. Um, I think I'll. I'm I'm guessing that Justin probably thought that like he just accumulated these chips. He's going to be playing splashy and applying pressure, but it seems like uh, that was a misstep. Well, it, it misstep him out of the tournament and a chance to win three super high roller rolls in one year. I mean, that's that would have been unfair anyway. If you <laughs> want all three, listen, Justin, pick up the next time, buddy. All right, you yeah, got, you got enough under your belt, kid. He also yeah, just he casually wins the one drop. 
I forgot about that. When I was going through one drop, I was like, who won one? Oh, yeah. I remember Justin won one drop for uh he, he had an incredible year for sure. It's a uh, one of the best years of all time in tournament poker, I believe. Yeah, I think it is definitively the best year in the history of poker. And I thought no one would ever eclipse Fedor's year, but only a couple years later they did. Well, we might say that no one's gonna be able to eclipse this year, but how could you do how could you just keep winning all of the biggest tournaments? I don't know. How, how? How's he do it? Uh, if, I, if I could, I would. But uh, I can't imagine someone. So if Justin won like the three biggest tournaments of the year, I would be very surprised if that were to happen again. Yeah, I would too. But if there are more, more big tournaments that keep coming up, then the opportunity is there for somebody to go pretty animalistic and maybe go to Triton, go to Montenegro, go to these places and be able to accumulate that type of success in one calendar year. Well, he won the three biggest tournaments. Like, yeah, it's not just like winning a bunch of tournaments, but actually winning the three biggest. I mean, it's ridiculous for yeah. sure. It's, it's insane. The super high rollable China, super high rollable America and the one drop that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty, I mean, what can you say, man? The guy had a great year. It's uh, pretty impressive to see. Do you feel like he was playing at a, different level during those things or just a combination of run well, play well, playing at a high level and, and sort of just, uh, you know, right place, right time sort of thing. Um, during like the super high roller bowl draft, I think uh, I had him like number two on my board at the time. I think I'm a huge believer in the power of heaters. Um, he's really great at the live element. Like I never pick up anything on him physically. Like I kind of, He's just, I mean, you see the streams. He's, I, I, he's moving his arm a little bit, like I, but uh, I don't know what he's doing. Um, <laughs> I think he's a great player. He is willing to put you in those tough spots. Like, even if there was a misstep with the ace four suited, it shows that he has, like, a willingness to pull the trigger in some big situations. Um, he's studied a ton over the years. At the time... When he's like winning a bunch, I, uh, I think, like I said, a believer in the, in the heater. So for super high roller bowl, when I did my drafts, I had Chidwick one and Bonomo two. Hmm. Not a bad top two. What do you, uh, kind of a couple questions I'm going to write down on my uh, notepad here. What do, what do you think separates right now? Some of the, uh, the top 10, P the top 10 players or top 20 players. What do you think separates those players from the tier below them? That might be that top 100, top 1000 sort of thing. Probably a more precise bet sizing. Um, being, I would say all of the best players are very well versed at all stack sizes and it's very challenging. Um, 25 and 100 or play very differently. And it used to just be like there'd be cash game players who are good with deep stacks and bad with short stacks. But I would say there aren't really any of those guys on like the top level. So you just have to be well-versed at all, like lots of different situations. Um, hmm. You have to be good at the, the live element, maintain your composure. But I would just, if I could say one thing, if I would guess it comes down to, uh, to bet sizing. It's interesting. You talk about the stack sizes thing, because I noticed just for myself is that, playing deep stack PLO tournaments or even playing 50 big blinds plus very comfortable doing that. But then once it got down to under 25, I was like, man, just, I, I like, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I can, I can theorize what I think might be good, but I just have not played enough 20 big blind PLO cash or tournaments, obviously, but cash specifically in my entire life. So I really struggled with just having an understanding of, of, what to do with those sizes and the and the blinds seem to matter so much in that you lose three big blinds or four big blinds you you go from 18 to 14 and then that that can make a pretty huge difference when it, when you get down sub 20 big blinds it seems like yeah the stack sizes play super differently halo tournaments i think largely come down to patience and like if you're in the money the icm is a huge factor so you really don't want to get all in so you just tend to wait around for a really good hand but there are situations that you got to take advantage of when there's like a raise and a bunch of callers. You have like a pretty good hand. Might be the best hand, maybe take it down. Yeah, try to figure I out the I think they just need an ante. 
PLO tournaments. That, that's that's certainly what's been um, you know what's been discussed a lot. I do feel like in the future, and I, I've tried to make a little advocation for this. I, I certainly have could, could go harder on trying to get the antis into these PLO tournaments during the World Series of Poker. But hopefully, we will see something like that at least experimented with, and I imagine it will change the dynamic a bit. And then hopefully, we can see that be a a regular thing that we see. So. What do you think about this P big 50 tournament? The World Series Poker announced its schedule. Seven events, I believe, they put up so far. First event, $50, $500 buy-in, $5 million guaranteed, $1 million guaranteed for first place, $50,000 in ships or some crazy shit like that. But opening weekend, that's going to be the number one event. To me, it's on the surface without looking much into it. Seems like a great opportunity to just get people out to Vegas right when it starts off and get that that boom out of the gate for the series and get that buzz going right away. So it seems like a pretty good idea, but what do you think about that? Sounds great for them. Um, I'm not going to bother to play, but you're not playing, you're not hopping in a Dan five, five, 500, no rake, no rake, Dan. Oh, it's no rake. No rake. Yeah. Wow. That's very on world series. Like, and I definitely respect it. Um, I like playing high stakes poker. And it doesn't feel like work to me. <laughs> uh, playing small stakes, I feel tethered to the table. I don't really want to be there, so I just don't really do it. Uh, but it seems like a great opportunity for for a lot of people, like especially if you don't really ever play tournaments. Dude, it's you it's one to click in. Right, it seems sick. Like, I mean, we all, you know, fifteen hundred dollars not that much money, I guess, when you think about it. But still, it's going to be a lot to a lot of people. But a five hundred dollar tournament marketed like this and sort of, you know, promoted like this, a deeper stacks, more play, pretty incredible opportunity to just experience the, the World Series and also kind of experience the dream of possibly winning an event like that. I have some friends from home that like poker but never really play. I think I'm going to encourage them to fly out. We'll hang out for a couple of days in Vegas and have them play. What's it called? Big 50. Uh, they should play the Big 50. What are we thinking about this name? Um, Big it's 500. Not a 50, Big it's a 500. Yeah, why didn't why isn't the big five hundred? Why would it be big fifty? Doesn't make sense. You're like, what the fuck does the fifty mean? Is it fifty k chips and man? We still not there's not there's still time to change at World Series Poker. I know you're out there listening right now at some point in time, or I'll talk to you when you guys at some point in time. So Trevor says, Poppy, any plans to become a Nolan Home tournament player? Got to be honest with you, little disappointed that I I didn't start playing Nolan Home tournaments because I I happened to start playing Nolan Home cash. And what my life would have been like if I started playing tournaments back then instead of cash. I've always, I've thought about that because. Did you play a main event this year? I've never played the main event, no. You got to play. Never played. You have to. Um, I'm going to. I'm in. Okay, this year you're going to play? This year I'm going to play. Okay, we'll book it. This year I'm going to play. I, I, I think I, I kind of want to. It's great value. It's exciting. People are enthused. It's, it's a special tournament. Okay, people are saying it's the 50th anniversary of the World Series Poker. That's why it's called the Big 50. I still don't like it that much, I'm going to be honest with you, because it's too ambiguous in terms of when you're telling someone, like, oh, what Big 50? Like, well, you know, it requires more explanation, whereas Big 500, it's a $500 buy-in. Big 500 just seems like it flows. I can understand Big 50 to celebrate the 50th anniversary. I feel like you could say 50th anniversary World Series of Poker with the Big 500 to kick off the World Series this year. I uh, I mean I don't know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be at the Rio though I'm gonna be at the series I'm gonna be walking around, be playing um some Fortnite on the on the stage if they still have it this year. So uh, I've never played. Don't play. Just don't. It's fine. I'm not good at video games, so I don't think there's a risk of me getting addicted. Okay, I, I I've never been addicted to video. I I used to be when I was younger, but I have not been addicted to video games. Any video game within the past sixteen years, except Fortnite. Okay. Are you any good? Um, I got okay, but no, I, I didn't want to get really good. Just seemed uh it seemed too addicting. So I didn't. Let's go two more questions, wrap it up here, guys. Uh somebody says, What's the bruise on my shoulder? You know, we got we got we we're fighting over here, man. The weight set working out in the gym just uh happened. What do you say? Probably doing some foam rolling. Yeah, it, I mean foam rolling helps out a lot. You kind of have that like a whole creepy dark look going on to you right now, brother. Oh, I switched. Uh, oh, here it is. Better. Oh, you got the love sack. Yeah. Damn. Which one did you get? Do you have the Do you get the big the super sack or do you have the one right under it? This is the biggest one. Okay. I think uh, mine needs to be fluffed, but uh, yeah, I've had that for a long time. That's like one of my favorite things I own is my love sack. Like you move, push it around. 
I do, do what do you mean? How are you supposed to fluff the thing? Like when it, you, okay. So you just like fight, fight it. You basically oh, start cool. fighting it. So you start like shaking it around like this. You start flipping it up to start punching the damn thing. You shake up the, uh, whatever the hell the things are called inside the kernels inside. But yeah, you just basically go to war with it and you're usually wore out and it's kind of like a fight. Okay. I'm going to do some fluffing after the pod. You got to. Yeah. Did you have the love sack when I was at your house, uh, earlier this year? No. Um, that was uh, a rental place, and that was just like whatever bean bag. I mean, it was a pretty. I like that bean bag, but it was just like a run of the mill. Okay, yeah, because I, I wasn't sure. I don't remember seeing the, the love sack. I, I always spot the love sacks because it's uh, one of my favorite things I have. Mark Rubin, what's the greatest life lesson there has learned from poker that equates to his regular life? Something about variance and I don't know if it counts as a life lesson, but when I bubbled a super high roller bowl a couple years ago after having like a big chip lead, it just became like very clear how fortunate my life is when I had the realization that even if I had won the tournament, despite the fact that I would have more money, my life wouldn't have changed at all. Mm -hmm. So I guess just like the reminder how like it's easy to to forget that we're lucky because your life just feels very standard, um, and I guess poker has helped remind me that I am very lucky and special. Mm. What's uh what's one piece of life advice or you'd give to people out there that might be watching this right now that are trying to get better in some type of way? Once you establish something as a habit, it becomes very easy. Like I've had people tell me like, oh my God, it seems so hard to meditate every day. Once it's just a thing you do every day, it's no longer hard. Um, and then I would just say, exercise whatever, in a way that you enjoy. Yeah, this is way too dark. Exercise in a way that you enjoy, uh, I think is really important and a great habit to get into. Hmm. I like both those. Dan, I just got some really exciting breaking news and, and I and I, I, I haven't been this excited for breaking news. I'm a little worried. No, this is sick. Okay. Dan, what kind of videos did I have I made this year besides poker? What kind of videos have you made besides poker? You have oh, any idea what MMA. MMA, correct. UFC, right? Yeah. The you went really deep on that uh Khabib thing. Yes. Guess what? What? The UFC is proud to announce a new partnership with poker stars. <laughs> What? I don't know yet. Just enough. Eight minutes. Breaking news. <laughs> I don't know what the details of the news are, but I don't know what to say right now. I'm just reading this first. The, the UFC is part of Poker Stars. I don't even know what the capacity is as of this, but I, uh, wow. That's big time. I wonder, I wonder who's paying who? It's got to be stars paying for <coughs> UFC, right? Well, I don't know. Is it, I was thinking UFC is so big that they don't actually that they don't really care about taking in like a few million, but maybe this is like a hundred million dollar deal. Well, that's what I'm saying because they're they're both and and Stars is in a pretty they're acquiring a lot of different companies or a lot of different. Uh, I mean, mainly in sports betting and kind of the casino game styles and those companies. But yeah, I don't know. They're proud to announce a new partnership. I don't even know what this means. This is uh, that is very exciting. I know. Whoa! What the hell? For you, they're they're joining forces for UFC 232, Jones versus Gustafsson. Wow, that's good. I didn't know that was still going to happen. Yeah, that's happening end of this month. Oh, I was under the impression that Jones was entirely GG after. Uh, oh, no, he's back, man. He's back, brother. He's back. Is that yeah? Okay. Oh man, it's exciting. Yeah, John Jones is back. He's back in the mix here. The link oh. is on. On Twitter, guys, it looks like Poker Stars is the official poker partner of the UFC first ever. Oh, it's in Vegas. I think I'm gonna go. That's yeah, dope. It's gonna be pretty lit, man. It'll be pretty. It'll be pretty sick. The uh, at 11 a.m. That's weird. What? That's um, according be. to Google, it's 11 a.m. at T-Mobile Arena. That cannot be really. On December 29th, 11 a.m. Uh, the 30th. No, 7 p.m., brother. 7 p.m. It starts. Okay. 
That'll be a sick card, though. There's a lot. Of, there's some pretty good fights on there with uh, Cyborg and Nunez. I don't know if you do you follow much UFC. I used to watch UFC, and then I was on Weed Brownies when um, Anderson Silva like completely threw oh, out, okay. just completely collapsed. Yeah, and yeah. Like, right. It was like it was a he was my favorite fighter at the time, and it was just like a a painful experience. Like I was just I was like way way too stoned, and I felt <laughs> it pain. And just for a couple of years, I was like, you know what? This is too violent of a sport. Um, I've started watching like occasionally, but I don't really follow it anymore. Yeah, well, uh, I I definitely know a little bit too much about UFC, obviously. So <laughs> now that I that I spent too much time researching, I feel like all this information, like anytime people ask me about the Habib versus McGregor and they ask me about Habib and McGregor just in general, and I know the information rolls off so fast. You're an expert. It, it scares me how well how well I know some of this stuff now. Have you trained any martial arts? No, I've really. I think I, I really want to, but I, I'm a little worried that if I go down that rabbit hole, like that'll take over my life in some ways because I do feel like I would have done that if I was a child and it was very popular. That's what I would have done instead of baseball, basketball, or football. I would have done that because it just seems like something where it's a one-on-one -on -one challenge and it's a lot of challenge against yourself and your body. So, and those are always the things I've really enjoyed about, uh, about sports or just about anything I've done is just like the, the, men, the challenge against myself. So I, I feel like that would be something I'd really enjoy just learning that whole process and learning the game tree of mixed martial arts. That, that just seems kind of fascinating to me. Seems like it would be a great skill to have, but, uh, I've taken like a few lessons and a couple of them. The learning curve is just so rough at like jujitsu when you like you can't move and you have this like this sweaty dude just laying on top of you and you can't yeah, yeah, right. about it. <laughs> yeah. all about it. It'd be tough. Kristen, uh Kristen Mashman. Hey kids, I'm late. How's everyone? What's up, Kristen? We're doing well. We're about to uh wrap things up around here with King Dan, Dan Smith. Definitely a great podcast. A lot of a lot of good wisdom in here, a lot of good charity discussion in here, some good poker discussion in here as well, too. And uh, I guess, Dan, yeah, moving forward, Charity, when does the double double up drive? When's that wrap it up here, man? December 29th. Um, okay. and we have an additional million dollars for matching. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, I would very much appreciate a small do donation. No amount is too small. Um, I was hoping to clear 1,000 unique donors this year. I think it would be good for like the longevity of the drive. So getting anyone to make a small donation would be greatly appreciated. Doubleupdrive.com, guys. Go out there, check it out this year, future years to come. What uh, what else do you have planned, Dan, now after Super High Rollable is over, Christmas coming up here? What do you got planned here for these next few weeks slash one month, two month? Um, I'm skipping PCA this year. I'm going to be playing some poker in LA. Okay. Uh, there's like WPT Hawaiian Gardens. I'm going to be on live at the bike. Uh oh, you're going live with the bike. Let's go. Okay. 100 200 game, deep stack cash game. It'll be uh, it'll be fun. Nice. That's awesome. I'm excited, um, excited I, for that to happen. Yeah, I think it will be January 11th. So I would encourage people to watch that day. I'll, I'm going to buy in deep. I'm going to be playing splashy. I think it'll be fun. Um, and then in, like, on the personal side, I'm turning 30 in February. So I have a long trip to Japan with some of my uh, closest friends. I'm going to be doing a lot of snowboarding and eating a bunch of sushi and ramen. I'm, I'm really stoked about it. Okay, so here's a question I have. And I've heard about this. So is the sushi in Japan really that much better than the sushi that we have available to us here? And if so, why? And how does it better? I actually would say if you've been to like any of the great places in North America, you've experienced really great sushi, mm -hmm. but ramen in Japan compared to ramen anywhere else I've had is like an entirely different food. I don't mean to like take, like the sushi is obviously great, but there is some great, like if you go to Kabuto in Vegas, Kabuto is great too. It's not as good as the best places, but you're getting like Japan quality fish. You go over there and you eat ramen though, and it's like not even the same food. I don't know how it's so much better, but it just, it's spectacular. Hmm. I have never had ramen before, so I do not know what good ramen tastes like. Uh, you should go to Ramen Sora on Spring Mountain. Is that the spot? That's the reg place that people go to? Yeah. I was a, a super regular there at one point. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to try it out at least one time. I mean, I, I didn't like sushi for a long time, and then I tried it, and I love it. So. Where do you eat in I Vegas? 
where do I eat in Vegas lately? I don't know. I cook a lot now or I'm at home eating at home a lot. I haven't gone out much for, for food in a while, actually. Not too much. But I do. I like the all-you-can-eat sushi places. Those are simple for a simple man like myself. I like Sushi Samba. I love that place. Listen, people are going to bash Sushi Samba at Palazzo. I fucking love that spot. They have these yeah. unique... Um, I've only got that place uh, delivery, but I think it sucks. See, that's what most people say. Delivery. I don't know if delivery is any good. But... I mean, maybe delivery room. It's, it's expensive, too. It is really expensive. Yes, it really It's like what? It's uber expensive. It's too expensive. For there's, sure. so, there's so much good sushi in Vegas. There's no... You, for less money, you can be eating the, the good shit, man. Like even Nobu's great. Yeah, Nobu's. I know. I haven't been to Nobu in a, in a in a while, actually. That's expensive too, though. Nobu's pretty pretty pricey. Yeah. You also said on Twitter that you think weed enhances music and sushi. With those are the two top two. What you think weed enhances? I have never gotten so high that I can't eat sushi or listen to music. And like other times, I've gotten. It, and there are other things when you get stoned, it's like, ooh, I don't know if I want to do this. Uh, but somebody actually made the very good observation on Twitter. Hey, maybe those are just like your two favorite things. So that's why weed enhances them. And that just kind of sounds obviously correct. It's a but really yeah. Good point. Um, I think a little weed and sushi are just, it's kind of my favorite thing to do. What do you think about weed and poker, Jason Spring says? Um... I'm personally up a lot of money because I started trying weed this year. I'm personally, I think it really helps me out a lot, but that's, uh, that's just me. I, if I'm going through a phase where I'm smoking a lot of weed, uh, poker masters is the first time I was smoking any weed during a big tournament. I ended up chopping it with deep eats. Um, I found I was having a hard time focusing on day one because I was a little bit anxious about a mental health post that I had written. Um, and I tried to just be like, okay, I'm going to crush a coffee and just like get in lockdown mode. And I just wanted to like check out and be on my phone. And then on the break, I just took like two small hits of sativa and I felt like I was able to like get past the bullshit and focus. Mm -hmm. um, it was also kind of a sign that I was smoking too much weed and I've since gone on a break. So like, man, I need to smoke weed during a hundred K tournament. That's not right. But, uh, I think it could, it could have its time and a place to like smoke like a tiny bit. But I think for the most part, it's got to be a negative. Um, but weed also affects you differently when you're smoking a lot of it. I tweaked my back real badly deadlifting this summer. Mm. And I was smoking a lot of weed to like cope with the pain. And then when the back healed, I was just in the habit of smoking weed. Right. Uh, so that's really the only time I've played high stakes poker while stoned. And it worked out well. Uh, but I probably... Won't be doing it too much anytime soon. Makes sense. Okay. I'm still an experimental stage, guys. I uh, people ask me about Adderall. I stopped doing via or uh, modafinil back in February last year, so I haven't been on any modafinil, Vyvanse, or Adderall for about uh, a year now. And I don't, I don't really do any of that shit. Yeah, I listen. But I, I tell people don't start. Like there, you know, it's it's sure. There's a lot of allure. It's great, but I would prefer just not to rely on that to. To, to there's got to be other ways I can get focused and, and figure out how to manage my life than have to be on ADHD meds. If I had to play like a 50 hour session, that's what I would want to do. But I just don't really want to incorporate that into my life anymore. Like, yeah, it seems better. Does it is the idea that it seems better to stay natural or, or what is the idea of to avoid something like that? I think it's a very serious drug that could have real repercussions. Um, I also, if I, I spend a lot of time trying to take care of myself, I'm not very informed about it, right. but it, I mean, I've, I've taken Adderall maybe like three times and not in the last like eight years, I would get jacked up for like 24 straight hours. That just can't be good for you. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I could see you specifically getting, cause you're already jacked up anyway. Yeah. Like you're, you're already fired up. You're already hyped up, ready to get after it. You inject that into your system. I mean, that's what happened to me the first time I ever did it. I played a 33 hour PLO session online. So <laughs> like that's the first, oh, oh, well, this is probably a, it can't be a good thing. Even if it's possible, it can't be a good thing. I'm, and I don't know if you love the way that you feel, then it's going to be tempting. Like, okay, I'm going to take it every time I play high stakes. Yeah. There's a lot of high stakes poker going on. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, there is. All right, guys, we're wrapping up in about two odd half hours here with Dan. You want to follow Dan? Go to his Twitter. It is going to be. Dan Spatala. Yeah, it's King Dan on Instagram, though, right? I yeah. think it's King Dan twenty three. King Dan twenty three Instagram. Uh, Dan Smith Hala on uh, on the Twitter streets. Where's the best place if you want to keep up with what you're doing, Dan, and keep up with the charity drive, and just kind of keep up with uh, with what you're up to in general? I would say Twitter is the best way to follow me, unless you like uh, and Instagram if you want pictures of food and mostly food, sometimes dogs. Yeah, I think Twitter's probably, Dan's pretty active on Twitter in terms of what he puts out there, in terms of kind of the things he says. He definitely tweets out some funny things, informative things, a lot of I'm information about- i to have some new charity announcements as early as January of this year. Um, I have a big idea for the project going forward. Uh-oh. I hope to have an announcement by the end of January. Well, Dan, I know uh, this year you reached out to me wanting to set something up ahead of time for the charity thing, and I, I wasn't doing much content at the time, and I was definitely in my own little world. So- Next year, in the future, let's make it a uh, let's make it a priority to kind of once this gets started, we can kind of do something, whether it's a small video or whether it's a podcast or something like that. Let's just kind of schedule it in now, pre-schedule for anything like this in the future, and that way we could kind of uh, you know kind of help make a difference totally. at the beginning of it rather than just uh, with you know a week and a half left to go. That'd be awesome. And yeah. also, I think it's over. I think we need to have like. Even though we're both fairly retired, it seems from going hard. Uh -huh. I think one day this summer, we just us and JC. Maybe you could bring Jonah. We need to have like one one epic night. Okay, I mean, listen, that 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 foursome right there sounds pretty fun for sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, JC's a fucking madman. That JC's kid is a legend. Oh uh, God, that is a le that is a legend of legend out of the line right there. I always would like try to raise the stakes on him and he just, it never happens. Like I tried to, we were partying all night at a wedding. I tried and he like made a joke about how we should get a tattoo. And I'm like, okay, I found a tattoo parlor. Let's do it. He just right. immediately jumps up. He's like, okay, let's go. I was just trying to like get one over on him to be like, Hey, maybe we shouldn't get a tattoo at three in the morning when we're wasted. Did, did the tattoo well, get done? We didn't get it done. I okay. can't. Right. Well, I mean, he still wants to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just keep it at that. I don't want to say it. It is what it is. Uh, shout out to my boy Coop out there, Nathan Cooper. Thanks, guys. Everybody in the chat, appreciate y'all. If you like the if you like the podcast, hit the thumbs up. It'll let me know. I should do some more podcasts next week. We got Christmas coming up, but I'm gonna be putting out content every day next week: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Do not know the podcast schedule quite yet. I will let you guys know. I know I'm gonna have on Nick Bertucci from Live at the Bike who uh, played the million dollar cash game. He's a very successful uh, entrepreneur in real estate. He gives a lot of talks. He's fucking all, he's a really awesome guy. So I think people are going to be kind of excited to hear from him, play some of the highest stakes cash games in LA right now. And uh, he's not a, not he's, he's, he's willing to battle. I'm sure Dan, you're actually going to meet Nick. He'll probably play in the game on January 11th. So you'll That's probably, cool. uh, I don't know any of those guys, but I think it, it'd be fun. And I do know that cash and tournaments are such different animals. It'll be fun to like step onto other people's turf and try to battle. Yeah, I mean, I, I something tells me I feel like you're gonna hold your own pretty well, Dan. But that's, okay. I'm a, I'm more I, I'm on the optimistic side, but I'm biased. But something tells me I think you're gonna be you're gonna be fine. I appreciate that. <laughs> all right, guys, we're out of here. That's it. Much love. Peace out. Thanks for all the comments, and uh, that's all we got. Thanks. Thanks for having me, and 